Good afternoon, everyone. I want to just make sure everyone's on. Oops, Commissioner Ortiz, Commissioner Sesson. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today is Tuesday, May 5th, um, 2020. It's 1 o'clock p.m. or just shortly after. Um, we are all doing this meeting uh, via Zoom, and I'm excited that everyone is here today. There's some things I'm going to read here in just a moment. And then I do want to, before we even start, I want to do welcome um, each and every one of the commissioners, Matt and Randy and C. Lynn. Um, I'm going to read uh, some information about today, and then we'll make sure we have quorum, and we'll go from there. So... The city commission meeting will be held via Zoom, an internet-based meeting platform. This public meeting, while being conducted in a virtual manner, in order to comply with the state of Kansas Governor Kelly's executive order, number 2029, will comply with the Kansas Open Meetings Act. It's been extended by our public health department until May 10th. The public is free to submit written comments via email to clin.hurtado at gardencityks Dot us regarding any item on the May 5th, 2020 agenda. And those comments will be shared with the city commission. Please include your name address for the public record. To participate in the virtual meeting via Zoom during, during the meeting, you may use the raise your hand function in the Zoom app to notify the Zoom moderator of your desire to speak. Proper meeting decorum is expected of all in attendance at the meeting and anyone who fails to act properly may be removed from the meeting. The moderator will call on individuals who have requested to speak using the raise function. We will allow everyone to, everyone to raise their question on the topic, but please be patient as we navigate through the raised hands. The public may participate in the meeting by using the free digital conferencing service, Zoom. So you'll find that Zoom link um, at our, on our Garden City, our City of Garden City uh, website, or you, can or you can also join by phone. The webinar idea, ID and the password are also there. The public can watch the meeting live on Facebook Live at Garden City, at City of Garden City KS and YouTube at City of Garden City, comma, Kansas. So again, we're gonna go ahead and any questions on that, um, and that I wanna make sure that all that information, so that's available to you if you'd like to join. We're excited when people do join, it really makes it for a better meeting. So with that, I want to call the meeting to order. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have a quorum present? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead. It's um, it's uh, Commissioner Cessna's uh, pledge. It's his turn to do the Pledge of Allegiance and invocation. So are you going to put the fl uh, flag up on the screen for us? See you Okay. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have provided us. Please give us patience and strength during these uncertain times. We ask for your guidance and grant us wisdom during our meeting to move our community forward in a positive direction. Be with all of our citizens in the community, but especially be with our first responders and healthcare workers, along with our other frontline staff, as they continue to care for our community. Watch over them and keep them all safe. Please be with us and provide us moisture and help nourish our land. We thank you for your continued blessings of our community state and nation and this we pray amen amen thank you commissioner cessna um great picture of the flag i hope that's one of ours that's that was really nice so today i want to make sure um we're going to talk a little bit about we're going to do the approval of the minutes so i know you've all had a chance to look at those which if there's no corrections are offered will stand as approved anyone have any corrections or additions to the minutes I talked to the city clerk the other day about uh, on item O and new business, there was uh, the second uh, part of the motion was missing and she was corrected that. Other than that, it looked fine. 
Any other corrections or additions? If not, they're gonna stand with that one correction and I know that she's corrected that, so there's no motion needed. So at this time, um, we will stand open for public comment. We have a 30 minute time slot. Again, we ask you that you keep your comments to five minutes. If you would like to comment, you can use the raise your hand function um, on our screen. So again, just uh, make sure that you stay within the time limit. And again, remember the decorum, we're gonna open it up for any public comment. We'll give you just a few moments to raise your hand and then we'll have a moderator call on you. Any public comment, Celine? Okay. With no public comment, we'll go ahead and we're gonna move into, um, is it item, item six, is that correct, Matt? It is, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, item 6A, the governing body is asked to consider and allow the mayor to proclaim May 10th through 16th, 2020 as National Police Week. And I'd uh, like to invite, uh, prior to a motion and a second, Chief Mike Utes to uh, present uh, a little bit on National Police Week. Chief. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, we're, uh, since May 15th of 2002, the police department, along with the Sheriff's Office, has honored the fallen law enforcement officers throughout the nation, as well as those who continue to serve. Uh, a memorial service is usually held in front of Finney County Law Enforcement Center during National Police Week. However, a ceremony this year will not be held at the LEC uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But as an alternative, a virtual recognition video uh, be made up by uh, the city communications and IT department as well as our PIO is working on this. And this video should be posted on social media on May 15th, 2020, which is Police Memorial Day. Uh, so the, uh, we're asking you to consider and allow uh, the mayor to proclaim May 10th through the 16th as National Police Week. The alternatives are to approve the proclamation or deny the proclamation and staff is recommending approving the proclamation, please. So what I'd like to do is we'll call for a motion in a second. And then just like we did last time, we'll go through a roll call just so we get everyone's name. Please make sure that you state your name and your vote um, so that we, uh, every time you speak, sorry, this is Mayor Unruh. Every time you speak, please state your name. And then again, we'll go through the roll call. So with that, I'd like to call for a motion. Commissioner Sessna, I'll make the motion to approve the proclamation as presented. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Sessna. Do we have a second? Commissioner Euler, I'll second. So the Commissioner Euler seconds. It's been moved and seconded. All of those in favor say aye or opposed say nay. Commissioner Sessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Mayor Unruh, aye. So we'll go ahead and I'm going to read this proclamation. And then, um, Matt, I, so that everyone doesn't have to hear my voice so much, um, I, would you mind reading the second proclamation? I think it's just as important, but that way at least it will have a different voice. So the proclamation reads, whereas there are approximately 900,000 law enforcement officers serving in communities across the United States, including the dedicated members of the Garden City Police Department. And nearly 6,000 assaults against law enforcement officers are reported each year, resulting in approximately 17,000 injuries. And whereas since the first recorded death in 1791, over 21,000 law enforcement officers in the United States have made the ultimate sacrifice, sacrifice and been killed in the line of duty. And whereas the names of these dedicated public servants are engraved on the walls of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C., and whereas May 15th is designated as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of all fallen officers and their families, and the U.S. flag should be flown at Hastap. And there, now, therefore, I, Troy Unruh, Mayor of Garden City, Kansas, do hereby declare May 10th through 16th, 2020, as National Police Week, and publicly salute the service of law enforcement officers in our community and in communities across the nation. We will further appreciate the service of our Garden City police officers Finney County Sheriff's Deputies, Dispatchers, the Finney County EMS, and the Garden City Fire Department, and others who do their part to help our citizens, thank you for your dedication to our communities. Signed and sealed this fifth day of May 2020. Thank you, Chief, uh, for presenting and for being here today. I, for those of you who have never attended the ceremony, it is um, it's very moving. 
it's a very solemn occasion. It's very honoring. Um, and so next year in 2021, um, I'll be sitting there um, with you um, and, and attending that ceremony. But I just, it's a really great opportunity. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for your continued support. Item 6B, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, is a proclamation uh, for uh, asking the mayor to proclaim May 2020 as Children's Mental Health Awareness Month. And I'd like to invite Kim Fisher from Compass Behavioral Health to speak just a little bit about uh, uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. Kim? Welcome, Kim. Hello, good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you so much for your willingness to help us promote this awareness and fight the stigma of behavioral health disorders. Now more than ever, the importance of taking care of both our mental health and um, physical health has come to the forefront with everything that's going on in our world currently. Garden City and Finney County is one of 13 communities or counties in Southwest Kansas that Compass serves. We currently serve over 500 youth with behavioral health disorders. And I just want to give a word of appreciation to our amazing staff that continues to serve those youth and families every day and has had to adapt to providing many of our services telehealth and is still finding a way to get that done every day. Um, again, we thank you so much for shining the spotlight on behavioral health awareness and helping us fight those stigmas. And thanks very much for your time today. Kim, I, I love your shirt, first of all. Thank you so much. That's bright, and we needed some color, so that's awesome. Um, and thank you for the work you guys do at Camp Compass. I know that you and all the people that work with you in the school system are doing an awesome job, and I know that you, like you said, even, even through the challenge, you're continuing to support, so thank you so much. Thank so you. I'll go ahead and call for a, I'll call for a motion. This is Commissioner Sussna. I make the motion we approve the proclamation as presented. Commissioner Sussna, make the motion. Okay, Commissioner Dick is seconded. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and we'll call for a vote again, yay or nay. Um, we'll go in order. Commissioner Sussna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Mayor Andrew, aye. So it passes with five eyes and no nays. And Mayor, at your request, I'll read the proclamation. Thank you. Uh, whereas addressing the complex mental health needs of children, youth, and families today is fundamental to the future of Garden City, Kansas. And whereas the needs for comprehensive coordinated mental health services for children, youth, young adults, and families places upon our community a critical responsibility and whereas it is appropriate that a month should be set apart each year for the direction of our thoughts toward our children's mental health and well-being and whereas compass behavioral health through its unique approach to serving children youth and young adults with mental health or substance use disorders is effectively caring for the mental health needs of children youth young adults and their families in our community and now, therefore, I, Troy R. Unruh, Mayor of the City of Garden City, Kansas, to hereby proclaim May 2020 as Children's Mental Health Awareness Month in Garden City, Kansas, and urge all citizens and all agencies and organizations interested in meeting every child's mental health needs to unite during that month in the observance of such exercises as will acquaint the people of Garden City with the fundamental necessity of a year-round program for children, youth, and young adults with mental health or substance use disorders and their families. Signed and sealed this fifth day of May, 2020. Troy R. M. Romero. Thank you. Thank you. Th Kim, thanks again for being here. It makes a difference. So we, we love seeing and hearing about the work. Okay. Thank you so much, Matt. We're ready We're for ready. reports. Yeah, thank you. We're ready for item 7A. And I'm going to invite Fire Chief Beatty to present the Garden City Fire Department 2019 Annual Report Chief. There it is. Good afternoon, <laughs> Mayor, Commissioners, and Manager Allen. Thanks for giving me a few minutes of your time in today's meeting. 
Uh, I submitted the 2019 annual report uh, the other day to all of you. Uh, Cynthia has been very diligent over the last several years of making sure that there's a good monthly report to you as well as an end of year report. But we felt that it was important to revive the uh, annual report format um, in large part for recruiting efforts going forward. But we wanted to make sure that, that the story of your firefighters and the officers above them gets told. And I think that that format is a, a good place to do that. So I wanted to present that to you today. And if you have any questions on it, I'm here to answer them. Well, thank you very much again for your time and uh, have a great day. Uh, Chief Beatty, we really, I really, it was really well done. The report was uh, exceptional. I mean, we always knew you did really great work and we hear your work sometimes around town as you're, and, and sometimes I get out of the way of your work. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you and uh, we're glad you're here in Garden City and we know that you came into an incredible history and I mean just a, a history and then also of what people have done before you I mean you you're building on a legacy and so we're excited that you're here and just when you make sure you tell everyone in your department thank you for all the work that they're doing and I thank you for that and, and I do want to point out um, several of my firefighters were involved in the various articles that were mm -hmm. in that and you also had Jamie and Lauren and Sophia over in the city hall were very heavily involved as well as Cynthia here uh, so it was a, a large, lot of people took place or took part in that and putting that in place. Well done. Commissioners, any, any comments for Chief Beatty or? I was, I was wondering, is this going to be a printed document that's going to be available for public to, to have in a, in a printed form? Yes. You guys should each be getting uh, the printed ones for each of the commissioners. There are also some, uh, uh, Ali Medina was going to take them over for me this morning and they should be outside of uh, the city council chambers as well as service and finance. I've taken some to the Finney County Economic Development Office, and I also took some to uh, uh, the Garden City Chamber of Commerce yesterday afternoon. So we have them hard, hard copy in a few places, and we also have the electronic copy. Good deal. It is a very impressive document. I, like you're saying, for a recruitment, I think this will be a really big tool to really show um, what what our fire department does and what y'all do so uh it's it's very impressive so thank you for putting that together thank you any other comments this is mariner any other comments all right thank you chief thank you all have a great day mayor and commissioners the remaining item uh, items under report of the city manager are uh, update on the organizational study action plan from the police department and the presentation of the monthly sales tax reports. Uh, uh, there's not a, um, uh, those are just printed materials for the purpose of this meeting, but if you do have questions on those, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Hey, Matt, Commissioner Cessna here. Mm -hmm. On the sales tax report, I noticed that is that a month delay or is that really comparative to what where we're at actually? Right. Yeah, great question. Um, usually, because I know because oh, I know with the shutdown or the stay-at-home order and a lot of our businesses closed due to that, it, is that is that an actual um, representation? Uh, it's hard to say, Commissioner. Um, great question. The uh, we used to have a pretty reliable um, kind of rhythm of sales tax receipts back from the state, uh, where we felt that more than likely there was about a two month delay. So traditionally, the the uh, April twenty fifth receipts, which are reflected in this report. Uh, would have been um, sales tax uh, receipts turned into the state by merchants uh, prior to the end of February uh, 2020. So uh, if that were the case, it, it wouldn't have likely 
the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the sales tax receipts wouldn't show up in this most recent disbursement. Um, now, that being said, uh, we would have expected to see uh, some impact. And so to see that that number was, uh, as you can see on the screen, the, the 533 compared to the previous year, 455, and even a history of April receipts is considerably larger. Uh, it, it, it's tough to know. Um, and then on the county side, our portion of the county, 393 compared to 355 last year, and even just hovering right around 300 in the, in the years before that. Uh, it's tough to tell. Now, I do think recent history, say let's say the last decade, uh, that steady rhythm um, has been disrupted from time to time for different reasons. Uh, I don't really see how it could be accelerated, uh, but there is the potential. We see a, the note the year or the month before was down quite a bit, which would have reflected January seats traditionally. There could be an instance where perhaps the uh, there was something that sort of system systemically slowed uh, January receipts from turning into March distributions. And then you had this big chunk of March distributions fall into April that otherwise would have been put into March. So uh, I, would, I would probably look at these two months in that light and still say COVID-19's financial impact hasn't showed up on our sales tax receipts yet. And uh, uh, we'll be looking pretty closely to the May 25th distribution. Thank you. You're welcome. If there are, Thank you, Ian. Was there another question? No, I just said that was a great question from Mariner. This is a great question from Commissioner Sesson. And I know that traditionally, um, one had indicated usually 60 days is behind and I'm wondering also about even with the state, with everything, you know, their ability to collect tax and get it back out to us quickly, that might be impacted too. So yeah, yeah the next couple of months, I think that will be something to be watching. And I mean, coincides with our budget too and all those, the things that we're planning. So I think that's gonna be valuable for us to watch, so. Certainly, and the budgets, uh, you'll begin seeing the general fund budgets, uh, uh, I think the next meeting, if not the meeting afterwards, and those are being, uh, those are being built uh, around a downturn in that number. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. We're ready for meetings of note. If there's no more questions on the reports, uh, call your attention to the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, legislative copy. The last one was also held uh, uh, virtually and um, I think was a, was a pretty successful, a successful one. And so uh, would, encourage you to participate in that if, if your schedule allows. And then the Economic Development Corp Corporation board meetings, they've been conducting those uh, uh, virtually as well. If there aren't uh, any other questions on the meetings of note, then uh, item 9A would be the appropriation ordinance. If approved, it's ordinance number 2506-2020A. This is this is Commissioner Cessna. I make a motion that we approve appropriation ordinance number 2506-2020A. So Commissioner Cessna moved. Is we have a second? Commissioner Euler. We have a second from Commissioner Euler. So we'll go down again. So uh, favor or not in favor, Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. And Mayor Anru, aye. So it passes unanimously. Thank you so much. I do want to tell you about the, the uh, chamber coffee um, or the, uh, the legislative coffee. I'll miss the bacon, um, which St. Catharines does an incredible job. So I'm not saying I'd go just for the bacon, but if you've never been, the breakfast um, is incredible. It's a wonderful time there. So just in case you don't, if in case you don't like bacon, just there's other things too. Okay. The, the next item on the agenda is item 10A. Uh, the governing body is asked to 
consider and approve an ordinance annexing a 1.328 acre parcel generally located at 3455 East Highway 50, which is east of Love's Convenience Store. If approved, this would be ordinance number 2863-2020. Uh, Carol Davidson, Neighborhood and Development Services Director will present this item, Carol. Right. No, we can't hear you. There you go. <laughs> um, okay, this parcel um, is located directly east. It's contiguous to um, the Love's property that they have right now. They actually um, are just, they should have purchased the property. I believe they closed yesterday on it. Um, what they want to do is they've always wanted to develop the east half of their property um, for a truck stop area, truck service area and um, parking. Um, but they realized they didn't have enough room. So they um, went ahead and purchased this property um, so that they can expand over into this property. Uh, this property, were, they were already using uh, Garden City's utilities back in 1999. They signed a consent to, to annex agreement. Um, so that's, that's what we have um, that, that actually carries with the land. So um, staff is recommending approval of this um, annexation. As you, it's it's hard to tell in the map, but um, the property that's highlighted in blue, and then the property right to the east of it, those are both kind of like an island of county within Garden City all the way around it. So um, your choices are to approve the annexation or not approve, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, Carol, this is Mirandru. So will we be in the same situation where we'll need to pay um, for the um, utilities for that? Is it the eight year, 15 year? I can't remember. I just lost whatever the time length. So is that that discussion going to have to go on between our electric department and the and the um, Wheatlands? Um, yes, this, it's actually a state requirement. So every property um, that's annexed into the city will have to follow that same process. Um, this one, since they did already um, have an, a consent to annex and they were already hooked up to our, our utilities, it might be a little bit different, but they'll still have to go through that process. Mayor, this is Randy. We, we will be considering the issuance of a franchise to Whitland Electric at a later meeting for this property. Okay, thank you, Randy. Hey, commissioners, any other questions on this property? If not, we'll go ahead and call for a motion. Commissioner Sessna makes a motion to approve ordinance 2863-2020. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Ken Dick, I'll second. So Commissioner Dick seconds. So it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, we'll go ahead and we'll call for a vote. Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Orler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Mayor Unruh? Aye. So carries five to zero. Thank you, Carol. I like your background. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioners, the next item is uh, a request for the governing body to consider and approve the schematic design developed by the Confluence design team. The Confluence design team will also give a preview of the next community input piece of the project, which will include weighing in on the name and theme. I'll uh, turn this over uh, to Jennifer Cunningham, assistant city manager initially who will then uh, invite the Confluence team to give a presentation. Jennifer. Um, good afternoon, this is Jennifer Cunningham, um, Assistant City Manager for the City of Garden City. Uh, I am excited to be in front of you this afternoon on several pool items. I know that um, it may seem like nothing's been going on because there hasn't been anything on the agenda, but um, behind the scenes, there's been a ton of work going on both on behalf of the Confluence design team and city staff. Um, lots of people participating in all of the things to get ready for this meeting. So um, today the governing body is going to be shown a presentation by the Confluence Design Team. You're actually going to hear from several members of that team talking about um, different pieces of the schematic design. 
uh, throughout that presentation. If you have questions, you can ask those at the end. If you have um, suggestions or, or direction or, or different things like that, there will be an option to provide those. Um, essentially, what we're asking today is that you either approve this schematic design as presented by the Confluence design team, or that you don't approve it, but you give them some direction to take back to the drawing board and make some changes or things that, that you'd like to see them work on. So at this time, now that Terry has his screen up and is sharing it, I'm going to turn it over to his team and let, let them show you the exciting things they have. Okay, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and uh, Commission members. We're excited to be here. Uh, obviously, wish we could be doing this in person, but we will make do. Um, before we go, Matt, I see you're sharing your screen. Uh, if you don't mind, yeah, I'd like to share I, mine. Yeah, Terry, I think I stopped sharing mine. Okay. So. Oh, there we go. Yep. yep. Perfect. Um, we just got a couple things we've added to these slides to hopefully make them a little easier to follow along in this remote format. Um, all right. So as I said, uh, yeah, we're we're happy to be here today. We want to give you an update on the schematic design. Um, you know, uh, short of being there in person, we're we're still very excited um, to to show you where we're at. A lot of work, as Jennifer mentioned, has gone on uh, over the last few months and. We are looking forward to getting your feedback, answering questions, and continuing forward. Uh, I'm going to touch on schedule uh, myself. Uh, Hank is going to, Hank Myers, our project manager, is going to do a very high level kind of overview of the overall site. Uh, and then we're going to turn it over to our team members. Dave Hamill is going to talk about uh, the architecture and the ideas that are developing around that. Uh, and then Doug Whitaker is going to. Uh, I'm not going to say dive, dig into the aquatics. <laughs> Sorry, I almost did, but I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, dig into the aquatics, uh, talk through that a little bit, and then we'll, we'll actually stop there for a little bit to let you ask questions. Uh, and then I will come back in and just give you a real quick uh, preview of the short list of naming ideas that we're going to put out to the public uh, for their input later today, and then we can answer any other questions you might have at the end of this. Uh, so the timeline. Um, when we showed this to you the last time, um, we were actually still looking at it as potentially a design bid build format. So there have been some updates to that, understanding we're moving forward with a construction manager at risk format. Um, so I am uh, going to kind of talk you through where we're at today and, and how we see this uh, moving forward after today. Uh, this green bar represents the kind of snapshot of where we're at today. We've delivered the schematic design packet that we're going to preview or review with you today. Uh, but, you know, based on schedule and as much work as we have to get done, we, we didn't just stop, you know, so we're continuing forward with design development. Uh, certainly things can be, um, you know, refined and tweaked based on input received. Pins are certainly not down yet. Um, but we needed to keep progress going. Uh, and there are one or two things on the site plan you'll see today that may be a little bit more evolved than in the SD package. Um, this uh, kind of dashed, light blue dashed oval indicates the, the theming uh, period. So um, you're probably aware we sent out a call for name ideas uh, back in March before things all kind of went on shutdown mode. Um, got some ideas from that. We met with a, uh, a naming committee and shortlisted that. And then, as I said, we'll, we'll be putting a survey out later today uh, for about a week. Uh, our goal uh, is to be wrapping up design development um, at the end of May, um, right around that time frame. Um, I'm going to jump down to that pre-construction line. Um, that's been the biggest change. Now that we know we're going to go with construction manager at risk, um, you know, if uh, hopefully things are approved and you all agree with us that McCown-Gordon is the right choice for that effort, uh, and then we can get together with them and immediately start uh, integrating them into the team um, because it certainly is going to be a collaborative team effort to carry it from where we are today through pre-construction uh, in order to start construction on time uh, later this summer. Uh, and we understand some of that, you know, is going to be discussed later in terms of uh, the situation with the pool this season and so forth. 
So that's just a quick snapshot. Uh, we're here today. We're trying to wrap up design development, uh, moving into construction documents later this spring, but the ultimate goal is to be rolling into construction, starting to uh, demo things, um, you know, later this summer and still with the intent of delivering a, a new facility that's open and ready for spring of 21 season. Uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to the rest of the team and let Hank take it from there. You guys just tell me when you want to want me to flip slides. Hey, Terry, real quick, I've got a question. Yep. This is Matt Allen, city manager. Uh, on the timeline, uh, does construction include demolition or does pre-construction include demolition? Maybe. Um, pre -construct so construction would theoretically, uh, demolition would the theoretically be included in the construction phase. Okay. All right, thank you. But that being said, depending upon timing, when the pool is, is when we're able to get in there and start working or when McCown Gordon or the, you know, the contractor could, um, you know, that could potentially be occurring while we're wrapping up design. Um, that's part of the efficiency built into a CM at risk pro uh, process. Okay. Um, so that's why we want to get, get them into the team soon. And, and the decision you all make today about the pool obviously weighs into that. Right. Okay. Thanks. Would it be fair to characterize that uh, uh, while there's some efficiencies that can be a, be found, that demolition was uh, uh, at least scoped as part of that orange construction bar starting September 8th uh, mm -hmm. and, and still allowed for uh, the opportunity to open for a 2021 season? Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the, the assumption was that Labor Day of 20, pool shuts down. Next day, we're, you know, they're out there starting demolition and, and prep for the new construction. Okay. All right. Thanks, Terry. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hank. Thanks, Terry. Um, just wanted to touch briefly on some of the site updates that have been made since the conceptual design was presented to you back in February. Um, when we come in off of Maple and 4th Street, we want to utilize the existing parking lot as much as possible. So we plan on um, milling and overlaying as much of the existing parking lot as possible, uh, but we are expanding the parking lot to allow for more stalls there. So there will be some full depth asphalt that's installed as part of that parking lot expansion. Uh, the circulation of that parking lot stays the same throughout the project from what you saw uh, back in the February concept plans. Uh, we are uh, a little bit further into the detailing on the drop-off area to the north, just off of Maple. Um, and you can see we've got the existing bathhouse that's being reutilized for the restrooms and the cabanas area um, that will also have the locker area. And then just to the west of there, we are doing a new administration and uh, concessions area there. Outside of the building, we have the concessions area. Um, we are incorporating as much shade as we possibly can into those areas. Uh, you can see some shade sales outside of that location. And then you'll also see shade sales um, scattered throughout some of the deck areas as well to provide shade for visitors. Um, but also where the cursor is currently, uh, there's a zero depth entry access point there. Uh, that will allow for some shaded areas within the pool. Uh, we also have a zero depth entry with some play features in there. Um, a lazy river that wraps around a uh, water slide area. And then also the fly high slides that were approved as part of the conceptual design uh, that we feel are gonna be pretty exciting new addition to the pool. Uh, the pool to the furthest to the south is the 50 meter uh, competition pool. Uh, that will include the ninja course that was also approved as part of the concept design. Uh, we have the diving boards down in that area as well. And then there is also a competition viewing area. Um, off to the east, you'll also see we kept the existing splash pad as we had in the conceptual design, uh, but we have incorporated some additional shade elements as part of that area as well. Down to the uh, southeast, we have the uh, mechanical building. This is gonna be a new facility um, that will include all new piping and structures around that. 
one of the other elements that we tried to incorporate more of as part of the uh, schematic design process are just uh, some additional sun turf areas, places for people to go out and lounge around, spread their picnic blankets out or uh, their uh, beach towels out and just have some areas where they can sit in the grass and hang out, maybe play some games. Um, and then throughout the, um, the uh, access points, I guess we've got the access point to the north through in between the breezeway of the bathhouse and the, uh, and the concessions area. As you come through there, that's gonna be the primary access point. And when you get through there, that actually opens up a lot of views to all of the different water amenities that you can see uh, to really build that excitement. And you also see that coming out of the restroom areas as well. What we've built in as far as uh, some additional efficiencies and some flexibility into this plan, uh, we are looking at opportunities to provide a secondary access point to the competition pool um, that will be coming off of the parking lot area there so that you can continue to have competitions and open up the pool and keep the leisure areas open at the same time. Another thing that we're also looking at, and you can see by some of the fences and the gate access points, is that we have the uh, existing splash pad gated off uh, to the north off of the pool deck. And what that will allow us to do is over time, um, you can shut down the entire pool for the season, but if it's still warm outside, we can provide a secondary access point into that area to allow for the public to use it even when the pool is closed for the season. So based on that, I will pass it off to uh, Dave Hamill so that he can talk a little bit further about some of the um, structure improvements. So Hank, can I ask a quick, this is Amir Amir, can I ask a quick question before you go off of that slide? Sure. Um, you know, on the back of the pool, our current pool, um, there is, it's a pretty big drop off on that south side, you know, when you have to come up from the street. Will you be Correct. leveling that at all, or is it gonna? It will. We will still have that big sloping area with that concrete wall there, or how will that look on the back? I was wondering that, and I forgot to ask it ahead of time. The edge of the pool is um, of the new pool is further north than the existing pool, so I think okay. the plan is at this point that we will leave that wall in place and slope down to it from that area but it should allow all of that to be at the upper level and not sloping down in that, in that location. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Great. Um, this is Dave Hamill with Barker Rinker CCAT. And thank you, Mayor and Commissioners for allowing us to have a little time with you to make this presentation. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, as Hank said, you know, we have the existing uh, bathhouse here in this, in this plan view on the right-hand side. And then on the left side is the new structure that we plan to build and creating this breezeway between the two buildings. So, uh, in the purple is, is the concession guard and admissions area. In the blue is all of the changing facilities and restrooms. And then in the beige color on the right is sort of a, a, a lobby, if you will, to access each of the cabanas. So we have four uh, family changing cabanas. So if you move to the next slide, we're going to zoom in on the the concessions and guards and admission area. And this will allow us uh, an opportunity to talk in a little more detail about how that is envisioned. So as Hank said, the, the parking is to the west. So people will be coming from the parking to the admissions area, which I've noted as one and two. We've got two admission windows. So if you get a large group coming or a lot of people in the morning, that we have the option of opening up two admission windows to let people in. Maybe one of them is set up for those that have annual passes. It, it, that's going to be something that we can talk about down the road. But uh, in working with our committee, the idea of having two transaction counters at that front entry 
was pretty important. And so after someone pays their fee to come to the, to the pool, they would follow the green arrows to the right and then go through the breezeway out to the pool deck or over to the changing facilities. Likewise, and the, the red arrow shows people that would exit at the end of the day or when they're done swimming, they would exit through a turnstile or an accessible gate. So if you've got a stroller or you're in a wheelchair or something, you have a way to get out. But it also allows, uh, you know, as a security point of, of control, it basically controls access so that it's a one-way system that you can only exit through those turnstiles and through the gate. And we also have a window from admissions being able to observe that whole area in the breezeway so that that's under uh, continuous monitoring. So that's kind of the admissions idea and the, the concept that we're moving forward with. As you come around, we have a guard office uh, that will be for all the lifeguards. We have a set of lockers in there. We have uh, a refrigerator, a microwave, a, a sink, and then a small table that would allow staff to use that space for having lunch or if they bring some food in during a break or something. And then we also have a first aid cot. If someone has becomes ill or we have a, a problem, someone overheating, there's a place out of out of the sun that they can lie down on. And then finally over on the west side, we have our concessions area, which will start with a, an order window on the, on the uh, south side. So you place your order there. And then we have a pickup window over on the west side that would allow for better flow of, of concession materials and food products to be ordered and that you won't be standing in the way of someone else taking an order while someone's waiting to, to get their food or their drinks. So we've got it kind of set up with an automatic uh, window system that will allow pretty much like the drive-through McDonald's and, and that sort of thing in order to meet the health department requirements. And then to, <clears throat> excuse me, to the north, we have a small storage area that will be set up for all of the, the food materials used in the concessions and any other kind of storage needs for the building. So that's kind of a, a zoomed in view of, of the new building. Uh, by the way, the breezeway will have a, a high roof over the top of it. We'll show you in a second, just a, a covered area. And we will have the ability in the off season using a, an overhead coiling door to close off the breezeway on both ends. So if you if you wanted to use it for storage of, of lounge chairs and beach chairs and stuff that you might have, you can store that in the breezeway during the off season. So let's go to the next slide. There's a view of the changing cabanas, the family changing area. So it's we're trying to take advantage of the existing building. Um, if you recall, there's some the concession windows are there at the bottom and we're going to open those windows up so that we have access to that changing family changing lobby space if you will in beige and inside of that area will be lockers that are available for all the families that want to use them there and then we've got four individual cabanas and each cabana is ada accessible so we have four accessible so it doesn't matter which one you go into, every one of them is an ADA accessible cabana. And each one will have a shower, a toilet, and a lavatory sink, and a, a bench area where you can set your things and change your clothes. Um, so each one, there's four of them. So you'd come in with your family and change everybody and then put your uh, belongings into a locker or take them with you out onto the pool deck. So that's kind of the idea behind the, the changing cabanas. We also have a janitor's closet in this sort of vestibule area that will service all of the restrooms and locker rooms. Uh, and then over on the upper left is a mechanical room that will house our 
water heater for heating the water for all the showers and sinks and so forth. And over on the east end is our electrical, uh, all of our panels and electrical service will come into the building there. The other thing to note is there is an existing basement and our intent right now is to demolish all of the equipment out of that basement and, and fill it with either gravel or some kind of flow fill to basically cover it over completely. Next slide. So this is the women's. This is on the, the east end of the existing building. So we'd access it uh, from the same, basically the same doors that we use currently to get into those locker sp spaces. Uh, we have a privacy screen so that we have a, a visual walk off from the outside. And we've got uh, lavatory sinks on your right and then uh, eight uh, water closets or toilets. Our goal was to try and get to eight or nine water closets and showers. Uh, we were able to get eight water closets or toilets and eight showers, including a, an ADA accessible shower, which is that lower one on the right. Um, but it's each individual shower has a, will have a bench so that you can set your clothes or your, your bag on the bench, go in and shower, there'll be a curtain to keep the water contained in the shower area and then have a dry off area outside of that for changing. So that's the, the women's side. And if you go to the next slide, we've got the men's is pretty much identical. Uh, other than we've got, uh, I think we have eight toilets and or urinals and we've got seven showers with one of them being an accessible shower. So in the end, we have the four cabanas are all accessible, plus the two uh, showers in the men and women's. So we end up with uh, six accessible showers and six accessible toilets. So it's a really very, very good in terms of accessibility and meeting all of ADA requirements. So if we wanna to go to the next slide, this is uh, an elevation view of the pool side of the existing uh, bathhouse and the new bathhouse showing the, the breezeway in between them. Uh, our idea is that we're going to use a textured coating to put over the top of the painted finishes on the existing bathhouse. The new, um, the new area will also have a similar finish. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, the roof of the new breezeway will be uh, structured out of blue lamb beams and a wood deck. So it'll have some nice warm materials contained in it. Uh, it'll have a standing seam metal roof over the top. Uh, also, the other thing you can see in this elevation are some of the outdoor lockers. So in addition to the lockers we have in the changing, uh, the family changing cabana area, we also will have these facing the pool deck and have access for anyone who wants to use lockers at the facility. Um, the existing windows, we plan to put in a new translucent panel system. It's a CalWall insulated uh, translucent material that is, won't require the, the grills on the outside, so it won't quite be such a, a jail-like feeling, but will allow a lot of nature, natural daylight to get into the, the changing area. So next slide. And then these next couple of slides are <clears throat> really a, a three-dimensional versions of, of what the bathhouse would look like with the existing building on the left and then the new on the right uh, showing a little pedestrian uh, railing as you, as you enter so you can kind of see how it would be a one-way system in and then a one-way system out through the breezeway to keep the facility secure. Uh, next slide is just, uh, again, another view from the, the entry side. And we plan to, to have some nice uh, covered areas over the admissions counters so that if it is raining or if there's any inclement weather, that when you're making your transaction, you won't be standing out in the rain. 
Um, uh, I think that's about all we need to say there on that side is the, the bath or the pool side gives you an idea that we're gonna try and put in a, a shading device over the concessions windows again, so that the sun won't be streaming in on the south and it'll always be in shade for the staff inside working. And likewise, the, the lockers that are facing the pool will also be covered so that they don't receive a lot of, of weather in the off seasons and during the season. So that's kind of the, the long and the short of, of the bathhouse piece, which I think is important. The other thing to say is right now, this is all shown <clears throat> uh, without any color. Uh, we're waiting to hear on the beaming uh, direction that we're gonna go and then we'll address what the colors might be. So I think in the next segment here, Doug's gonna talk about the pools, but we have some three-dimensional images that, that show the bathhouse with color, but that color is really just a placeholder. So don't feel like that's final or any final decision has been made about that. We're just uh, trying to illustrate what it might be. So with that, I'll turn hey, it over to Doug. Yeah, this is Mayor Andrew. I'm just, I am shocked that that, that much space in the bathhouse, the existing one. So oh, good. <laughs> I mean, the way that you have used the space, I yeah, that is, that's surprising. And that looks yeah, we, nothing like it does now. So we better take yeah. a lot of pictures because people will never believe. They will <laughs> that's never for believe. sure, they'll, they, they, they won't believe the it. And they will not believe it, so. Absolutely true. Wow. Thanks for that. Hello, Mayor, and hello, Mayor and Commission members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Well, thank you. It's it's great to be here. And after those great uh, uh, site plan and architectural um, uh, presentations, it's uh, it's really uh, uh, it's great to be here to kind of talk through all the different excitement. As you can imagine, looking at this new entrance facility, and as you come through the gates and seeing all of this large water out in front of you, all the fun activities, you know, that's kind of what we wanted to do is create that entertainment, watertainment zone that you can see all these activities for, for you and your families. And so as you come through this uh, the entrance, you the neat thing is we're looking at uh, uh, the adjacencies with the uh, locker rooms there, but it's also the shallow water, the components. You're, you've got the inner, the social zone and the zero depth entry. The nice thing about that is they have a great solar orientation. They have a lot of deck seating area. And with that zero depth entry, and in addition to the splash pad, you know, that user age group are not consummate planners. So it's really good that those people are located close to the bathroom facilities. And so I think that that's one of the really good strengths about this design that, that it, it not only is a fun, has great solar orientation, but all of the conveniences are very close at hand, including the concessions area. All of us as parents know that when you have children that uh, it's not too long till they become hungry and it's nice to have that concessions very close by. And so having that great view from the locker rooms and the entrance is really important. Um, one of the things that we look at with that zero depth entry, that's gonna have a lot of that. It has a, a walk-in style beach entry as a nice play structure with all sorts of nice little sprays and things that appeal to that younger user group. But also you can walk through that area at, in a nice ramped entry and not get wet. So it appeals to us parents that maybe don't wanna get wet. We can then go into what's next to that on the west side is our social zone. This nice social zone provides an area as kind of a transition from that shallower water to more of a, a, a three and a half foot to five foot of water depth where we have some bench seatings, people can sit and talk and we can kind of, oh, that's a nice launching place for going into the, the, the lazy river. Um, we actually have a nice set of stairs that come down from that social zone that will have some inner tubes next to it so you can grab your inner tube on your way in there or coming in from the zero depth entry, you also have some abilities to bring a nice, uh, your, um, your inner tubes into the river. Now we have a very nice long uh, uh, 305 lineal foot, it's 10 foot wide. So three tubes can go along with each other. 300, 
uh, five feet of length around the perimeter plus an action channel. In that action channel down on the south side of the, of the slides, you'll have a, an ability to go through an area where if you go through that area, you will get wet. There'll be sprays and, and geysers and things going into that area. Or you can take a more gentle route to the outside and um, uh, not get wet. Um, so this is a very exciting channel. Now, one of the things we have our slide complex that is the, the keystone of this area. And so that we have a slide tower there that actually has three different levels. As you come up to one level, you have the kind of the initial um, high fly slide. Now the high fly slides, that, that particular one is only 18 feet from the deck level. And it's a, it's a nice um, uh, 76 foot run to into the competition pool, into the 15 feet of water. Or if you extend up into the next um, platform, that's actually um, 30 feet in height and you have about a 91 foot slide down into the pool. So you're gonna be launched even further out into the pool. If you walk up to the top tower, that's 35 feet in height. We actually have two slides coming off of that. One is the inner tube flume that actually has 348 feet of lineal length and you come into the plunge pool. And the reason that's so funny, you, you actually go down it with an enclosed um, tube you go down it and it opens up and then you come into the plunge pool. At that time, you can choose to either stay in your inner tube and go on the river and join your friends that are floating around, or you can actually get back out and go back up to the tower and ride it down again. Um, so that's really exciting about that. Starting out again at that 35 foot tower, we also have another body flume. We wanted to kind of have more, a little bit more relaxed, um, less, um, intimidating slide that comes down there. That actually is a nice open body flume and it goes into a run out. Now, one thing, just so you all know, we do have all good designs allows for expansion in the future. We actually have the opportunity to add another fly high slide in the middle of those two slides. And we have a opportunity on the 35 foot tower to add another slide, you know, of a, of a more aggressive nature. So that kind of talks about all the fun things. As you're floating around the river, you can consider getting out and enjoying, enjoying your friends on the slide, or you can float around the river. And uh, we have waterfalls and all sorts of fun activities there. Now, kind of going over to our 50 meter pool, we have this has a really a nice facility because this not only will provide a great competition pool for swimming meets and swimming practice and all of those things, but during the day when, when people aren't practicing, you can actually do practicing on the short course levels uh, going 25 yards back and forth. We have six lanes that could actually hold competition. Or we have another four lanes you could actually have practices in, but they aren't deep enough for diving. And then we have 10 lanes of the 25 meter or 50 meter course for, for uh, competitions. And we position the spectator seating gallery so you can, you're right next to the primary starting end. So you can actually have a great view of the finish. But even with, the, with that really fun ninja course in the center of the pool, you're gonna have good visual connections to the entire pool. Um, throughout, uh, 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 if you have a swimming meet, as Hank also talked about, we can have this operate as a separate entity while not removing all the fun aspects of the uh, leisure pool to the community. So just kind of uh, uh, some of the things that are going on here. Uh, we actually have the, the, high, the fly high slides. We have three diving boards, one two meter and one three meter board. So that engages a really fun uh, age group for population. We have the, you know, the really exciting ninja cross um, going across here that can be you know, lowered during the day and then taken up when you have swim practices, either long course or short course. So this is very dynamic. This facility has a lot of great multi-generational appeal to the youth of all ages and abilities. And it's gonna be um, designed to be very um, cost efficient to operate, maintain, and very durable over the years that it will be operational. So I, I just, that's a, a quick uh, preview of all the different fun things that we have talked about 
Yeah, yeah this is uh, this is Mayor Unruh. So, how what's the capacity the the participant capacity of this of this episode? Um, you know, we basically uh, went through a lot of that, uh, um, uh, and I'm I'm just um, off the top of my head. I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 to 1,400 people. Wow, that's great. And you know, the neat thing about it is that that not only do we have that capacity, but the way the decks are designed and the, and the arrangement of this, people will find the spot that's most appealing to them, and they won't feel crowded in that large of a crowd. That's a great question. Thank you. Doug, this is Matt Allen, city manager. Uh, the I, I really like the some of the some of the planning that's gone into uh, just what you talked about the different use of the deck space um, doesn't seem to put too much uh, emphasis on any one part of the deck space uh, that allows for the, the facility to uh, um, I guess feel more um, uh, maybe inviting and less overwhelming uh, for those that don't want to be uh, feel like they're surrounded by 60 people all at once, but at the same time, it, it, it looks like there's a lot of activity and it'll, and it'll always feel uh, busy and active. I think that's great. If you wouldn't mind going to the, um, the bird's eye view of the footprint. And if there would be a way to zoom in on the 50 meter pool, that would be great. If not, uh, you can just address it with words. The okay. uh, like, uh, having having sat through a few summer swim competitions, I like the <laughs> fact that this spectator uh, area faces north. Not that there's going to be a way to avoid sun in in June and July, uh, but uh, the fact that it's facing north gives a slight relief. Is there anticipated in this drawing to be any? Um, any shade, uh, whether it's uh, over the top of the seating or just something uh, a little more elevated that provides some shade relief in, in the top uh, two or three sets of stand, uh, stand seatings or rows of stands? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, this is Doug uh, with Water Technology. And we do anticipate having shade in that area so that when we we kind of visualize it those probably will be tip and roll bleachers that will be able to be placed in there when you do have swimming events and then taken away but the shade will remain because that will uh, you know again it, there's a lot of little moving parts that we need to consider here but that area is going to be very popular because and maybe some of the spectator seating stays there because watching and viewing that ninja course is really going to be a popular activity to be able to kind of see your friends competing at that level and going across the ninja course. Um, but shade is a very important thing. And, and I think that um, that's one of the things that when we look through the operations, we really want to make sure that we have enough shade initially, but also opportunities for to introduce more shade, but have the deck clearances, like when you do have a swimming meet at the primary starting end on the um, a west side, you know, there's plenty of space for all the uh, participants to be staged for the heats and everything like that. Um, and but then on the turning side, the officials, we've, we've looked at how we can have officials moving through here to be able to um, um, have them, uh, you know, control the meets and all of those types of things. Sure. That, sure. Did that answer your question? It did. I have another question. Is there, there is it anticipated that there's going to be uh, the, both the infrastructure for placing the blocks on the 25 yard uh, configuration uh, and sufficient blocks ordered. It appears that there's 20 blocks, 10 lanes, blocks on both ends of the 50 meter pool um, that is, is that, uh, you know, I guess the question would be, is that necessary uh, to have blocks on both ends, uh, or or just. Um, uh, that's a great question. So, yeah, it so like they would be necessary on the twenty-five yard as much as they would be necessary on the fifty meter for youth swimming. So during during the summertime, the the uh, it's really long course season, 
So there, it's really appealing to have long course events in the 50 meter pool. So that's one of the um, considerations that we've uh, done for this pool is have the 10 lanes for um, uh, competitions. So you could have starting at the primary end on the west side and the turning end would be on the, on the um, east side. But every once in a while, you're gonna have those just 50 meter sprints. So there would be a desire to have those 10 starting platforms on the east side as well. So you, could, you wouldn't have to stop the meet to be able to relocate the uh, starting platforms. Typically, um, one, of the, one of the things that we, we wanted to make sure that we have is a minimal water depth for the safe starting off of those platforms of seven feet. So this is a little bit of an unusual configuration in the fact that the, the, the starting end and the turning end are both minimum of, of seven feet. On the west side, it is seven feet. On the east side, it's 15 feet. But so that creates an opportunity to have a shallow zone in the center of the pool. And so that's where you have a set of steps for that center pool. So when we start to configure with all the space clearances for the the fly high slides, the ninja cross and things. But that kind of ends, ends up with is we have, um, I believe we have uh, nine or 10 cross course lanes that are 25 yards in width, you know, for length. However, only six of those lanes are deep, in, are deep enough water to provide starting platforms for. And so again, understanding that Long course is kind of the king during the summer months. We, we focused on that as opposed to the short course events of 25 yards. Does that make sense to everybody? It does to me. Are those removable blocks? Yes. And, and the, the important aspect of that will be that, you know, um, ultimately we'll decide if there's going to be 10 or 20 of those blocks, but they would be also be able to be used on the um, six uh, short course lanes, we'll have anchors that will fit each one of those blocks so you don't have to get new blocks for the short course and long course sides. Thank, thank you, that was my, that was my question. Uh, and one final, um, I don't know that this would be as easy to describe from this picture as it would be the overview one again, but where the, and maybe, maybe it is, uh, the area which would be south, um, well, I guess if you could put your cursor on the stair staircase that begins to go across the Lazy River onto the island where the, the slide towers are, um, that, that's the access point for all, no matter what slide you're going on. That's correct. Okay. Uh, is there, so is it in, is there some intentionality where the plunge pool is, where the run out on the non-plunge slide, and then the fly high. So those they're dispersed around. Is that is that intentional from a foot traffic flow perspective? And if so, what are the advantages of where the plunge pool is located for folks that are carrying tubes around, you know, essentially from 10 o'clock back to five o'clock? Uh, the the activity the activity ring that's a great question and so the the slides were intentional intentionally placed there to kind of provide easy access because it's a little bit unusual to have slides that go into two different pools and you know we have the the the, the high fly fly high slides that go into the 50 meter pool and then we have the slides that go into the um uh, plunge pool and the run out and, the, and possibly a, a speed flume. But we did look at placing those steps so it's convenient for everybody to use that. Um, and it's not that um, long of a, a hike to be able to take your tubes. If you're going to take your tube from the um, uh, uh, plunge pool back up, up to the uh, top of the slide tower. Um, it's, it's, uh, I know it seems like a long distance on paper, but it's uh, Typically, it's not a. It's this is not an unusual length to be able to get back onto the slide tower. Okay. Um, and it and it was also the other thing that's kind of important that we we feel 
is that we, we wanted to try to conserve costs by having a single tower as opposed to multiple towers placed all over the place in the, in the design. So having one single tower kind of, you know, Disney started this whole idea of having one kind of uh, 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 event um, queue so that everybody that's going up has, you know, uh, uh, fun going up and excitement talking about it as opposed to having multiple things placed all over there. But the other thing that's another important aspect to this is the um, can, we can control that whether we're going to, you know, if we're going to having a swimming meet, we can actually close down the high fly, the fly high slides and still maintain the water slides for the um, uh, leisure pool. Thank you. Doug, this is uh, Mayor Andrew. I want to ask a question. I want to make sure and open it up to the other commissioners and, or anybody else who has questions. So, you know, um, currently our pool is about, it takes about 19 guards a day to rotating to actually run the pool. So how many guards do you anticipate this complex taking um, to maximize safety and also efficiency? Um, Mayor, this is Doug. Um, we have that figure. Unfortunately, I don't have it off the top of my head. Let me get that I was trying to, to find, you. I know I saw it and I can't remember it now. I just, I got, there were a lot but, of figures this time. Yeah, so. that, that was discussed. This is Terry. That was discussed as part of the pro forma that Ballard King had built out for us uh, in developing the concept. Um, the numbers in there, and that was a, that was an estimate based on a concept that this, this really is still fairly close to. So, you know, the, that'll have to be further refined once this, you know, is completely settled. But, but the number that uh, Jeff King used in that would still, you know, get you pretty close, if not the exact number. I apologize for not having that off the top of my head. I, I think it was 11, but I can't remember anymore. So I mean, it seemed like we cut a lot of out, but I was just, I saw the placement of some of those on your, some of the, uh, the drawings, but I didn't see the placement of, of lifeguards. Yeah, I would be interested in that. So I'll, I'll try to find it too after this. I can't remember either. So thank you. Uh, commissioners, and we'll do a lifeguard plan. We'll do an updated lifeguard plan. So you have that. Any commissioners, um, I want to make sure and open that up. If you have any questions about the presentation so far. No, Commissioner Ortiz. I, I was kind of wondering on what, as far as lighting goes, I didn't see any on plan. What are, what are our, what is our city going to do as far as like evening swim? Do we need any lighting out here? Um, and then also I didn't see anywhere where we had drinking fountains in separate areas where we can go to and, and get a sip of water out of a drinking fountain. Um, there's another, a lot of other questions that I have, but how about we start with those two first? So from a lighting standpoint, um, the parking lots will be lit. And then we do have it planned to incorporate lighting into the pool deck area to allow for evening activities. Um, I know there's been discussions about evening swims and any number of other activities. So there is plans. Uh, we don't have specifics yet on what those fixtures look like, uh, but we, we do have it in the plan to incorporate lighting as part of the pool deck area. And as far as uh, drinking fountains go, um, Dave, do we have any incorporated into any of the alcoves? Uh, that's part of that's where we would uh, have one, at least one drinking fountain inside the family uh, changing cabana area. Um, but you know, if you wanted one more remote out in by the 50 meter pool, that's something that we could consider. In terms of the lighting, if you read through the schematic design report, there's a fairly uh, good description it's just in narrative form at this point. We haven't shown the lighting uh, on the plans yet, but that'll that'll show up in this next phase. Okay, thank you. And then, so going back, I think that's everything as far as the design, the layout looks pretty good. I thought maybe there'd be some hot tubs somewhere, but <laughs> um, I can get by without those. Um, the other thing I was kind of wondering was in the, if we go back to kind of the ADA showers and and in the toilets and things, what size are you looking at for the family toilets? So those are about, I think, 10 foot by 12 foot, somewhere around 
that. So they're uh, about a, about 140 square feet, something like that, each one. So the shower itself, it would be like oh. a 36 inch by 36. Yeah, it okay. is 36 by 36. Yep. I think just from a you know a father's perspective, um, you know, with my toddler and and. <clears throat> I think I'd like to see maybe a little bit bigger. I know we've probably got a little bit of room in there to stretch that out somehow. Um, yeah, one of the things we were trying to address was making sure that each one is ADA accessible, which mm -hmm. requires a fold down bench. And then the, the shower controls have to be within so many inches of the bench. So when you, if you make one of those, uh, you deviate from that size then you you lose the ada compliance so you know if we wanted to make you know two of these ada compliant and two of them not we could make make the showers larger i would think but we'll look at it we'll look at it and, yeah. and see what we can do okay uh, and then as far as i don't like the idea of curtains um just because you know in a public facility, they might get tore up pretty quickly. Um, we'd like to see more of a, a panel, you know, a, a, a fixture type door instead of just a curtain, but that's just my preference. Yeah, I think uh, in the individual showers in the men's and women's area, we probably don't have enough room to, to allow for the swing of a, of a panel door type, uh, you know, shower door. And you, kind of. Yeah, and you show like eight inch block, it looks like in there. I don't know if we can probably go down to a four inch block and you gain some space there, with, you know. Yeah, we're, we're looking at that with our structural engineer to see if, if some of those CMU walls could get narrowed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we are making that a consideration, which again, will make them a little more generously spaced. Um, but as far as trying to get fixed doors, uh, we can look at that, but I think there are some challenges that may not be you know, readily apparent to just looking at it. Yeah. So, and then I think uh, if we go, I kind of noticed in the men's and women's both, you had four laboratories in the women's and then five in the men's. Yeah, I think we're going to cut down to just four in the men's. I think that was a graphic error on our part. Okay, it just kind of looked like it was pretty really tight. close um, together. Yeah, I but, um, and uh, so changing stations, do you have any located in there? I kind of when I was looking at the plans, I saw some little white out block areas in the family toilets that looked like those were probably changing stations. Oh, in terms of uh, I've a diaper changing station? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have those in every one. Okay. So we do have that addressed as part of our plan. Okay. All right. And then in the concession area, and I don't know what the city thinks or mayor, what you think as far as concessions goes, I'd like to see us I mean, if this is a, a new building, I'd like to see us use this as much as possible for sales because, uh, you know, when we go on breaks, there's a lot of people, especially if we have this at max capacity of 1,200 people, I think having two concession order windows would be better than a one and then a pickup. And that might be some, a good place where we can maybe rearrange and gain some more space in the concessions area and utilize that where you have it kind of in that room east of there and north of the guards room. I don't know what that portion is for. Um, that, but those are two, that space. Yeah, those are two desk stations where, uh, you know, the head lifeguard or, or yeah. someone from admissions would have a place they could go back to a desk and have access to a computer and, and do some paperwork if need be. Okay. But we could look at that order window and maybe widening the the order window, so there'd be two, two order transaction spaces there. If you wanted to, wanted us to consider that, we can. I think there's enough room to do that. I mean, I just think it's another area where we can gain some dollar. I know right now it's hard to talk about money, but um, 
I think at this time, we're just probably out of plan since this is a good addition. Um, and one last question I had for the concessions area was a three compartment sink. If I know some of the older ones don't have it, but some of the newer ones are installing one in. So that might be something we should probably look at. We'll take a look at that with our plumbing engineer and, and talk with the health department to, to see what, what we need to do there if that's required. I think typically that's for, you know, cleaning utensils and, and you know, if you're dishwashing, if you will, having the three compartment sink, if we're using disposable cups and disposable uh, where we may not have that requirement, but we'll look into that and, and make sure. That yeah, and it wouldn't be so much. Yeah, and I wasn't thinking something like where you'd have a grease separator, it'd be more of just a, a bigger type sink, whether it be, you know, for cleaning, yeah, I know probably measuring some things out. Some, sure. Some things like that. But. But that's a good, actually a great idea. I, that's something that I don't think we have shown in there yet. So I appreciate that. Other than that, I think that's all, I mean, everything looks great. I appreciate you guys putting in the work and, and not stopping so that we were, we're at this point. I, I know some people are probably, you know, wondering why we're talking about this, but some are, you know, it's better to talk about something different, something positive for the city. So I appreciate all the work. Thank you very much. Any other commissioners have questions or comments while we're at this? You know, I, I do appreciate, um, this is Mayor Unruh, I do appreciate uh, Commissioner Ortiz is talking about, you know, right now the concession stand, we have one window and people line up and you have to stand. If you've ever had to stand, until we painted the blue, if you've ever had to stand on hot concrete, well, I'll tell you that will, that will challenge you whether or not you want to eat something or not. So <laughs> yeah, I think the dual concession windows, that's, uh, that's a great idea because during the breaks, on how we'll handle the breaks, but um, that's right. Really, people no one go hardly go to concessions except at breaks, and then it's packed. So that might be the way that when we run the pool might be different too. So I'm sure it will. Any commissioners? Any other questions? Okay. Okay, I will kind of take it from here and just kind of click through these. Uh, illustrations one more time just so you can kind of see the view you know looking from the entrance looking over the buildings into the into the aquatics and as as Doug had mentioned that that real wow factor when you're walking through that breezeway after you've entered and you see all of the excitement of the slides the ground mounted play features right there in the forefront uh, one of the other things that uh, you know we look at when we place these features uh, Doug mentioned the proximity for the non-planning young kids to get to and from restrooms. But if we have groups that come in, keeping track of all of them as they're sprinting through, um, we want to be mindful that we've got shallow water uh, as well as even places uh, to disperse them. So plant, you know, placing planters just inside the entrance so that you can't sprint right in to a three foot or four foot deep. Uh, pool, but you've got to kind of make your way around. So we're trying to do that thoughtfully as well. View here looking out over the, the, the lap pool and the ninja course um, and back to the slide. So some, you know, definitely going to be an eye catcher. A lot of excitement, a lot of energy, um, some pretty dramatic change from, from what you see today. And then just seeing, you know, how we can do some shade over the pools. Uh, integrate the landscape into the into the pool deck, the run out over here versus the plunge pool and how that can just float right out into the lazy river and around. And then this kind of final shot, just looking back over everything. You know, Matt, you raised the question about shade. One thing that we're going to continue to look at is is how to provide good shade, I would say. Um, you know, um, swim meets aren't always at high noon when the sun is directly overhead. Um, so we want to be thinking about making sure the shade that we're providing is actually useful. There may be some sort of vertical elements done along here, whether that's landscape or some other type of screening mechanism that provides 
some shade from the south and west. Those, you know, those evening swim meets when you're you're the person sitting on this end, you know, left side of your face is burnt when you're finished. Uh, we want to be mindful of that as well and just provide some, you know, put some additional thought into that as we develop the design. All right, uh, theming, and then we will wrap it up and get out of here. So uh, we have four options that this will be a survey that will go live. In fact, I need to get this link to Jennifer uh, so you can get it to the folks that will make it go live or at least uh, share it out on the social media. Planning for this to go live at 5 p.m. tonight. Um, so after this meeting and after you've uh, previewed this, then the community will have an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, and then we're going to run this for one week, give them a week to weigh in. And so that by the middle of next week, uh, we've got the ability to distill that input and bring that back to you all to make the final determination about what this new facility will be named. Uh, with any luck, at least one of the four options is something that people like. If not, we'll, we will be with the committee and get back at it. Uh, so with that, um, first option is Thunder Basin. And the way this will be presented in the survey is with a collection of inspiration images that we pulled from, uh, as well as some beginning to think about potential color palette that, that pulls from some of that imagery that evokes or that uh, a thunderhead or, or the sky around a thunderstorm evokes. And then thinking about how that's interpreted through water or through play or in the theming of the apparatus. So thinking about a big downpour and can we do something with water that really provides that sense of a thunderstorm? Um, but then you also have sort of the subtle tie back to maybe the thundering herd of bison and the buffalo being such an important part, important part of, of Garden City's history. Uh, and then each of these will also have this, this narrative to sort of begin to get people to thinking about what this place could be. Option two, Garden Rapids. Um, you know, again, it's pretty easy to picture how rapids can be conveyed uh, through play and, and water features and splashing and things like that. Um, and just think that, that that sense of kind of connection of the garden and the rapids together, um, we can do some real cool theming with some of the creatures that, that uh, play in and around streams and, and rivers and things like that, that, that could become fun characters out here at the pool. <clears throat> Then we go to option three, Garden Oasis. So there's a lot of discussion of the committee about this notion of, uh, especially in the summer, things in Southwest Kansas can be a little hot, a little dry, a little brutal, um, but Garden City can be that oasis. Garden City is considered the economic hub of Southwest Kansas. It can also be a place for fun, uh, respite, rest, uh, a place where you can freshen up, have fun in the water and play and get excited. So there is a place for green in Southwest Kansas and this, this we think could be a cool way to, to play that up. Uh, and again, a lot of fun things you can do with different creatures that find their way to those, those wet green spots, um, you know, out in the landscape. And then finally, uh, world of water. Um, so thinking, you know, about something that's maybe bigger than life, bigger than just Southwest Kansas. A um, couple of thoughts behind this one is, a concept that was presented by the public was celebrating the diverse, uh, the cultural diversity of the community and how that's such a, a strong feature that's embraced uh, and makes Garden City unique uh, to a lot of other communities. But then also the ability to really do some cool thematic things with these, these big major water bodies that are occurring throughout the world, whether it's Niagara Falls or the Nile or just different places like that could be a really fun and uh, educational as well as fun and interactive way to celebrate water. Um, in addition to what's discussed here, we also, uh, the committee talked a lot about what's going to be something that is attractive from a promotional standpoint. You know, we want people beyond the city limits to, to want to come here. You know, this is, this is really an opportunity that can serve the region. Uh, so we want to have something that really sparks excitement and interest uh, from the young people um, and, you know, the young people are going to get their parents to come here. The parents are going to come because the young people get them to come here. So how do we excite them? And I will say that some of the best input we received 
on the committee probably did come from our young people that were a part of that. Uh, they're very honest, um, you know, uh, and that's good sometimes. They're very direct. And so it's, it was a great experience working with them. And uh, hopefully the community will respond to at least one or more of these. Uh, the input, we're going to ask them to just tell us how they like each one or don't like each one. We're not asking them to rank or pick one or, or rank them in order. We just want the community to tell us, essentially, they're going to be asked the question, do you like it? You know, I like this or I hate it. We're going to ask them to rank it a scale of one to 10 for each of these. And then we'll bring that to you all. You get to make the hard decision. Um, so with that, any further questions? Um, and if not, then uh, I think that concludes our presentation. Terry, could you run through, this is Mayor Unruh. Could you run through those just one more time? And then I'd. Yeah. So, and they're not in any order, not alphabetical or anything. Thunder Basin, Garden Rapids, Garden Oasis, World of Water. Thank you. Terry, I was just checking to make sure my color may be off. Was that purple in the first one that you were using? <laughs> well, man, I'm going to try to work purple into anything I can. And I want to throw props out to Commissioner Ortiz for having the right color in his background, as opposed to whatever that thing was you were just drinking out of. Okay. Um, <laughs> this one, we'll, we'll give you this one. How about that? <laughs> you know, we do have otters, so I thought that was cool then. Yeah, so the <laughs> otter was kind of fun. That was neat. So that. Yeah. So, you know, I think any of these, we can do a lot of fun things with. Um, like I said, hopefully hopefully we've struck something here that the community will, will get behind. And I think they're all, they all have merit. As, as we kind of closed with the committee, it was, do you feel comfortable with any one of these being the name? Um, because if the community picks one you're not comfortable with, you got to live with it. And everyone agreed that they could live with any one of these names. Uh, hopefully you all will uh, get some good input from them and maybe it'll make it easy for you. You know, we'll see. Appreciate so. that. Commissioners, do you have any other questions? And then I just, I wanted to check in also with Sealand and see if there were any comments or questions on chat or that you've been emailed. I think the presentation, Terry and your team has been exceptional. It's really exciting. I have to hold my stuff down a little bit. So <laughs> knowing that well, it's, this, great. this could be several years off or, you know, so yeah. And we're only talking about a little over a year here. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is Shannon Dick. I have a question. Um, when we're talking about some um, potentially major changes, like when we were when we're talking with the construction manager at risk, they were like talking about putting the to get ahead on the construction schedule to have an alternate spot for um, the mechanical building. How would you go forth on doing some of those? I mean, minor changes. No big deal, but something right. like that. What would be the process going forward on, on some of those bigger changes as we come forward? Sure. This? So um, that's essentially that's what happens starting, you know, if, we, if you approve McCown Gordon as the CM today, they get under contract ASAP. We, you know, we'll be on the phone probably before the end of the day today. Um, you know, talking about when we want to get together and start integrating them into the team. Those decisions start to get fleshed out um, from now uh, through this pre-construction period. Big decisions like that. Uh, we want to get their input. I've already suggested to our design team that notion from what they shared in their interview. Uh, so we've already sort of discussed it. Um, there's some, some pros and cons to that that we will definitely consider. But yeah, that's what happens uh, starting right now um, because we all want to work together to get this uh, built uh, in the time that it's been promised uh, for the budget that's been promised and, um, you know, in a, in a way that maintains the excitement and the integrity of the design. And they're, you know, I think that's part of why our you know, selection committee landed on them. They're committed to that as well. Celine, I'm checking in with you. I can't see you, but I, anybody, any questions from the public or that? No? No. Okay. Okay. Okay, Jennifer, anything else? Um, 
Yeah, really great job, everyone. I wow. This is Jennifer Cunningham. I don't have anything specific for you. Um, just want to thank uh, the Confluence design team for being so easy to work with and accommodating our needs um, during this time that we've had to do all of our meetings and, and everything by Zoom. Um, so I really appreciate how awesome they've been about that. And then, um, yeah, just let the community know that we will have this up around five o'clock tonight for them to weigh in. And we're really excited to hear their feedback. So um, before you now is a motion to um, approve the schematic design or to uh, not approve it or give any additional feedback that you all have. And I've made notes of, of the things that you guys did uh, mention already. And we did as well. This is Commissioner Sesta. I make the motion to approve the schematic design with uh, the comments and changes that were talked about. So we have a motion. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Euler, I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. So any further discussion before we go for a roll call vote? Okay, seeing none. So Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commi Amir Unruh, I say aye also. So yep, capacitors five. Five to zero. Thank you so much. It's um, yeah. If your presentation wasn't so good, it wouldn't be so easy. So but, yeah, really, really, <laughs> we appreciate. Great yeah, we appreciate it and uh, appreciate all the kind words and the good input. Uh, we will keep working at this and look forward to getting back in front of you again soon. So thank you. You guys have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Hey, can, can we hang on and listen to the rest of the meeting, C Lynn? Terry, yes, I'm not C. Lynn. This is Matt Allen, city manager. You, you may, you may, uh, you may stay on. Okay. Thank you for clarifying who you were. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just thought I didn't know if I should go stream it on the website or if we could just listen in. She's pretty powerful. C. Lynn is. So this is Mayor Andrews. She's yeah. So I think we're ready for the next item, but Mayor and Commissioners, it's um, item 12B, the governing body is asked to consider and approve a construction manager at risk uh, and the necessary boring at the big pool. I invite Assistant City Manager Jennifer Cunningham to present this item. Mayor and Commissioners, good afternoon. This is Jennifer Cunningham, Assistant City Manager again. Um, I do have two items wrapped into this memo, and so I do want to make sure that we talk about both of them um, as we go through this. And then I do want to note that um, Todd Knight from McCallum Gordon is also on this call, and I have visited with him prior to the meeting, and he's going to, um, at the end of this, before you make your vote, um, he's going to be available to answer any additional questions you have um about this process or about their company and then he has a few words he'd like to say to all of you before you before you make your vote um so we uh during the february 18th meeting the governing body uh agreed to a construction manager at risk process and that that process would be used to deliver the new aquatics facility um that we've been working on um, also, during this, uh, the March 17th meeting, we brought to you the request for qual qualifications that we wanted to put out um, in order to receive back the uh, submittals for the construction manager at risk. We received eight of those, and they're listed before you. Um, we attached the one that we're recommending to the packet. However, um, we have put on our website, as you can see in the memo, um, a link to all of the others in case someone is interested in taking a look at those. And commissioners, we actually provided those to you in the large binders that you should have um, if you'd like to reference one of them. So the first round of this that we went through um, was essentially to take the eight companies that had made submittals to the RFQ process and narrow them to four. The purpose behind that was to um, make sure that we were only interviewing those that we were seriously considering for the project and then also um, to make sure that we weren't wasting anyone's time on either side of that. So we used a scoring system that is also included in the packet and that's called the first round of scores. Um, you will see from that that we essentially selected four 
the top four on the list, um, that would be Donlinger, McGowan, Gordon, Hutton, and uh, Nablos. And we actually scheduled each one of them for an interview. We interviewed them all on the same day. Um, and that committee that interviewed those was made up of Commissioner Dick, myself, um, Aaron Stewart from the Recreation Commission, Andy Liebelt from Public Works, and then um, the Confluence design team had Terry and Hank participate in those um, calls. And then they actually did their scoring as a, as a team. Um, so they only counted as one, not two, two towards the scoring process. Um, and so we did these interviews by Zoom, um, obviously because of everything that's been going on. Um, each, each team was given a set of questions and the questions were the same for all the teams and they were given 30 minutes to present on those questions. And then we reserved 15 minutes for questions at the end of those. So during this process, um, we all took notes and kept score um, based upon um, the questions that were being asked. And then we got together after the end of the interviews and spent about 90 minutes um, discussing those interviews and um, coming to our final um, conclusion, which was that we wanted to recommend that the commission select McCowan Gordon for the construction manager at risk. And just to highlight why we really um, were in favor of them, we felt like they this entire project has been based on community engagement and it's been based on um, really leaning in and hearing what the community is telling us. And McCowan Gordon, that was one of the things that they talked about most during their interview is how through the construction process, they would engage the community um, and participate with our community to make sure that they were aware of what was going on the entire time. Um, and I just thought it was really cool. They had a great story about um, when they opened the one of the facilities that they built, um, the concession team wasn't ready to go because it was a third party group. And so the facility wouldn't have been able to open with concessions. And so McCow and Gordon, their team got together and ran concessions for the facility um, on the first day so that they would be able to open. And they were just very ingrained in the community in which they're building in. Um, they have really good ideas about how to utilize local contractors. Um, and all in all, we felt like they were on the same page as we were about um, how important this project is to our community. So with that, um, that's who we are recommending for the construction manager at risk and who we're asking you to approve today. Um, in addition to the construction manager at risk, there's another um, pending issue that will be part of this project, which is um, boring uh, by Terracon that needs to be done in order to continue to move the project. As you as Terry mentioned during his presentation, both Confluence and um, if McCowan Gordon is selected, they'll begin to work immediately with each other to get on the same page and start uh, the pre-construction era, you know, getting getting everything finalized. And one of the really important things they're going to need is to understand um, the makeup of what is um, under the facility. And so boring the holes that are attached to this are crucial. Um, I spoke to Terracon and they understand that um, we are discussing today uh, the 2020 season and that we are discussing the CMAR and that we are discussing um, the schematic design. So they understand there's a lot of moving parts, but they would like to start that tomorrow um, and really get this, this project underway. So we are asking uh, both of those items, uh, the boring to be approved and the construction manager at risk. I think that is a complete presentation. I'll answer any questions about um, the process that we went through, the scoring on the first round or second round, anything related to um, staff work on this project. And then um, I'll turn it over to Todd Knight to just um, say hello and introduce him. So. Yeah, this is Mayor Unruh, Jennifer. So I just wanna, and you can answer, I mean, um, for all of these four um, organizations that you're recommending were made through the second round, um, has Confluence worked with any one of these organizations? Um, so Confluence may have worked with more than one of them. Um, I know that um, that he that Terry had had conversations with several of the project managers. Um, they had reached out to him and had conversations about working okay. together and, and that relationship. And so I know that he, Terry would have would have been able to work with any of the four. His group would have been able to. Um, but I know specifically that that um, Confluence and McCowan Gordon have done um, some projects together. And um, they actually, if you read through all of the RFQs, you'll actually see that. Um, McCowan Gordon listed Confluence as a reference. So um, just for information purposes, but um, they've, they've worked on a couple of projects together. 
Jennifer, Commissioner Cessna, you talked about boring. Is that going to create an issue if we, you know, later on we discuss the opening of the pool, maybe possibly for this season? Would that create an issue of opening? So, of course, my answer is I hope not. Um, and I've discussed that at length with Terracon. Um, and there's, it, it's problematic, right? I mean, uh, we, the idea is that if everything goes perfectly, they go in, they do the boring, they fill the holes, they take care of all of the logistics that, that happen, and we go on and we, we do whatever we need to do, and everything's fine. Um, but as you all are aware, as we've had many discussions before, we don't necessarily know entirely everything that's under that facility, where everything runs and how it runs. Um, some of the things that could we could run into might be really easy fixes that we fix in a matter of a week or a few days or whatever it may be. Um, and you know, we really hope that's the case, but I cannot answer the question as to whether or not with 100% certainty that, that there would be um, no impact. Any commissioners, any other, any other questions? Great question. Any other questions for Jennifer or? This is Shannon Dick. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I sat in on the interviews with the construction manager at risk and all, all four of them uh, did a really good job. And, and like Jennifer said, um, these guys, Mikhail Gordon uh, did do some of that extra steps to, to get in contact with us, even, even through this whole process. So um, that was really good to see that they, that they generally look like they they care about this specific project and, and that sort of thing so uh, but again all of the all the ones that we interviewed did a, did a very good job so they would have they would all do well thank you commissioner dick i did notice um in the mccallum gordon they did have a list of a lot of local and or regional people that they've worked with and i i really appreciate that i did see that in some of the other of course hutton and some of the others also so i really that they've been in our area and they know who we are so i thought that was another benefit to all four of the ones that you chose for the, the second round. So. Any other questions or comments? This is Commissioner Euler. Um, and I just wanted to also comment on the fact that I did appreciate seeing all of the different uh, um, ref, um, RFPs. I thought they were really well put together. Um, I think the one that stuck out for me with McGowan Gordon is the fact that um, they live stream their construction sites. And so that again, is that community engagement piece. Um, but I also really appreciated the fact that they um, give their employees a list of local places uh, to uh, use while they're in town. And so I, I also appreciated the um, community connection as well. This is Commissioner Ortiz, and I don't know if I would talk to anybody from McCown Gordon unless it's Pete. <laughs> We had the we had the privilege and option you know opportunity to work with them in Dodge. So um, you know McCallum Gordon is a great group. Uh, they were they were awesome. To, they streamlined everything. Everything worked smoothly. So I I don't have anything but good to say about them. So and I'm glad I didn't have to go through those interviews. Um, but it's good to see some some people who do connect with the community and, and have been here before. So thank you. This is Mayor Andrew, Commissioner. They, thank you for spending all the time. And Jennifer, I know that the staff time has been tremendous. I did notice also that the, the cost was probably, I was, you know, I was surprised at the variation in costs and that, I mean, I know you didn't pick it based on the lowest cost, um, but the total cost of $629,230 was actually the lowest on your scoring sheet. So I was really, that was really refreshing to see also knowing that we want to get the most bang for our buck. So with that, do we, do you have any other questions or comments, Jennifer? I'm sorry. No, Mayor, I actually wanted to comment on what you said with that because it was kind of fascinating. Um, of course, we looked at the fees and whatnot in round number one because that was part of the analysis for that. Um, but going into the interviews, we didn't put that out for everybody to look at while we were having conversations. And when we got down and sort of have, started having a discussion between kind of our top two, um, and we were we were leaning towards the, then um, the confluence design team said, let's just look at fees and see where they are. And I think we were all kind of blown away at that point at how low McCowan Gordon was. And we just, the Confluence Design Team believed that was um, because they might really be interested in this job and getting into our community and, and making an imprint um, here. And so um, we were excited, of course, to see that the one, the one that we were gonna recommend um, had such low fees. So, so with that, I'm going to, 
Do you, if you guys have any questions, Todd Knight is actually on as well. Um, and he's the one that has been reaching out to me. He's the one that um, set up the interview and he's also the one um, that's kind of the principal in charge of, of this project. And I know he wants to at least say hello to all of you um, and, and kick this off before you make your vote. Yeah. Welcome Todd, we're glad you're here. You bet, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful, well, thanks for the warm introduction, Jennifer. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, this is, we're absolutely honored to have an opportunity to talk with you all today and have an opportunity to potentially be your partner on this project. I'll tell you that when we were selecting our team internally for the pursuit and the interview, we had people clamoring for the opportunity to be on this team. We don't have opportunities to be involved with projects like this each and every day. And, um, you know, when you can engage in a project that will positively impact a community, for hopefully the next hundred years. I know that you all don't build pools every day. Um, it, we just think that it's a heck of an opportunity and that I think is reflected by our excitement and passion for the project and also our fee proposal. Um, this is a project that we kind of hand selected and set aside as one that we really were in, interested in and we're excited to pursue. Um, so, you know, we, we pursued the project with kind of three main aspects to reinforce why we think we might be a good partner for you all. One is of course our experience in aquatics projects. We've built over 20 municipal pool projects. So this is very comfortable for us. We know how this process works. Um, you, you talked earlier about our relationship with Confluence. We've done over 20 projects with Confluence over totaling over $400 million worth of work. We know how our two teams work together. So there won't be a learning curve for our two teams to engage with each other and hit the ground running this afternoon. And Terry wasn't exaggerating when he shared that. So um, we really look forward to the opportunity and engaging with you all, hopefully in person. It's here soon and not uh, via video conference, but um, we are just, just really appreciative of the opportunity. So thanks for giving me a few minutes to share. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioners, anybody, any questions for? Or Todd, I, I do appreciate it. I see it. And the one project in Dodd City, which is a close to ours, it took you 15 months. So yeah, so that's um that's a good timeline. Yeah, that was a much well, I'll say a little different in the way that that project was constructed. It was um, a massive site that was developed, uh, the surrounding parks and different things. We had to reroute um, storm detention and uh, diverted the storm water around the pool footprint, which took quite a bit of work and, and pre-function before we were actually able to even start the aquatics project. So that took several months before we were able to hit the ground and really start building a pool. Um, but yeah, that, that was a project that's very near and uh, appropriate, I think, as a representative project that's similar to what you're considering. Commissioners, any questions or comments or? Yeah, Commissioner Cessna, again, just going back to the boring, if if we delay doing the, I'm, I guess I got hung up on the boring thing, but uh, no, the uh, McGowan-Gordon presentation, very, very good. But if we delay the boring, would that um, put the project, delay the project at all? Um, Mayor, it's my understanding um, that the boring needs to happen tomorrow um, in order to keep our project um, timeline going. Um, we spoke with Terracon, I spoke with Terry. Um, we had several conversations back and forth about what was the drop dead date. And I even pushed for it to be tomorrow um, because I wanted this to be something that you to weigh in on. Um, and I wanted it to be a decision. decision before we did it um but honestly tomorrow is if we wait um we might as well wait until um the season's over because it, even if we do it do it in four or six weeks from now it could have the same impact so um you would have to wait till the season's over which then you're delaying that information that they have which delays all of the other things that come up to that um and todd may be able to speak specifically about how how that might affect our project but um, I'm told that yes, it would completely change our um, our turnaround time for getting this project done when we're hoping to finish it. 
You bet. I can absolutely share a little color to that, Jennifer. Um, so the borings give us the information to understand the soil conditions in and around that pool. Um, it's particularly interesting at this point with the, we all know the pool has been losing water for years and years. So we want to understand what that has done to the soil conditions below grade. And that will dictate the foundation design for all of the components on the project site. So we really need that information because of course, the first thing you design on any of these facilities um, is the foundation systems and then you go up. So that first piece of information is critical for the, the schedule of this project. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Todd, for that clarification. It's, yeah, that's, with that, any further questions or um, comments? And if not, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll open for, or open for a motion if we have one. I'll move that we approve the recommendation committee and choose McCall Gordon to be the construction manager at risk for the project and proceed with boring at the big pool. Commissioner Cessna will second. So it's been That's moved and alternate seconded. One. Yeah. Alternative one. So it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion from the commissioner before we take our roll call? So again, uh, yay or nay, Commissioner Cessna? Yay. Or Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Oiler. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. And Mayor Enru, yay. Okay, so that's that we got it done, Jennifer. I guess the boring happens tomorrow or this afternoon. They are scheduling it right now by email. I'm receiving them. <laughs> it doesn't take long in this time in this time and age. So thank you so much. Todd, thank you again for being here today. We appreciate work. We're, we're excited about working with you and your firm. You bet. Thank you so much for the vote of confidence and we can't wait to get started. Chair and Commissioners, item 12C, the governing body is asked to consider whether to open the big pool for the 2020 season in light of COVID-19 and the corresponding requirements of the state and local health orders. I invite uh, Jennifer Cunningham again, uh, Assistant City Manager, to uh, present this item. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Again, another pool item before you this afternoon. Um, I know that it probably feels like you um, were just talking about having a season less than a year ago. Um, and I know everybody is uh, was geared up and, and excited for this last season. But as everything that has happened um, over the last um, several months, staff felt that it was important that we come before you um, and talk about the impact that uh, COVID-19 has had on the normal schedule for the pool season and preparations thereof. Um, it's it's um, a little uncertain of, of what the reopening is going to look like for public swimming, training, and all of the things that go along with, with a 2020 pool season. So um, we have several options before you um, about the 2020 season, and we want you to um, consider and understand that we have been doing everything we can to understand what other cities in Kansas are doing. Um, I've participated in a couple of phone calls that included everybody from Red Cross to CDC, um, cities and counties and um, private pools, um, homeowners associations, everyone really fighting that same issue um, about what their 2020 seasons will look like. And many of them are going to be making those decisions this week, just like you are. Um, a couple of them, like Manhattan, has already determined that they are not going to have a season. Um, but with the um, governor's plan that rolled out last week, um, we understand that public outdoor swimming pools are part of phase two. Um, Phase two categorization means that if not otherwise restricted by a local decision, um, the Finney County Commission or um, Finney County Public Health, um, that we would be able to open once we reach phase two. Phase two has a um, not until deadline around May 18th, but obviously that could change. Um, those That's not set in stone. Um, and depending on a lot of different factors, um, but there would be, no limit on how many people could go into the facility, um, you know, capacity things, but not necessarily the, the mass gatherings doesn't apply to the number of people who could come in. We just can't allow people to gather in that size of group. We would have to have them keep the six foot distance that we've been doing for social distancing and some of those things. Um, 
it, if you decide to have a 2020 pool season, um, it will take, uh, you know, some time for us to get the pool ready. It would also take it some time for us to get some training. We're working on a few things um, to see if there's some alternatives, um, both for recertification and for um, certification for guards. We have some new guards coming on that are not yet certified that we would like to get certified. Um, right now, we have had uh, conversations with hiring approximately 62 seasonal employees. Um, we were only able to get about eight of those conditional offers finished before um, COVID-19 happened. However, um, once the restrictions start to lift, we would work on getting the rest of those completed. And I know um, they're excited to come back to work um, and want to work at the facility this summer. Um, so uh, if the other thing that, that is important um, for all of you guys to understand is that um, we, we aren't asking all of you to select a specific date to open the facility. We're, we're simply asking today for you to determine whether or not you want to have a big pool 2020 season or whether or not you want to forgo that season. And so a lot of what we put in here is um, some analysis on um, hypothetical situations. Um, we used a hypothetical for a nine week season, um, which actually means that the, there's water in the pool for 11 weeks. And that changes the number of days that normally in a, in, a, in a regular season, we would have 124 days where the pool had water in it. In a scenario where you have 11 weeks of swimming, the water, we would only have 77 days where there's water in the facility. And so losing 200,000 gallons of water a day, you can factor into the things that actually hit our bottom line, which are chemicals. Um, the other thing is, is you go down to 63 days of actual swimming, swimming days, which reduces your operation of staffing. So you'll see in the memo that I project, it would represent approximately $70,000, $70,540 in savings um, to shorten the season. And we could play around with any hypothetical to figure out what that looks like. This was just the one that, that we utilized kind of based on what we thought might, might be achievable in the period of time following the governor's orders. Um, the other uh, thing is that um, once this decision is made, um, of course, we would want to get to work immediately getting the facility ready to open and getting um, back with all of our staff to make sure that um, we can get them up and ready to go and, and then we would start planning for a date. Um, the, the other things that you'll see in here is that um, the chemical reduction is $725 a day. Um, the staff uh, expense reduction is uh, 2650 a day, but the other side of that is by being closed, revenue is reduced. Um, so revenue is reduced by $883 every day that we are um, closed to the public. So um, that's something to consider also, and that was offset in the um, $70,540 in savings. Um, there are when you talk about chemical and um, staffing, those of course are factored on the number of days that you have water in the facility and the number of days that you're open to the public. But then there's other expenses that um, if you decide to open, we're going to incur those expenses. And if you decide not to open, we won't incur those expenses. And those are things um, such as uniforms and uh, the money that we have set aside to um, get the facility ready to go, whatever that may entail, um, supplies for lifeguards, um, supplies for concession, um, the other thing that, that we would factor into that is if we run into anything, any small repairs. I know you guys talked about last summer that if there was a major um, issue, then it was a no-go. But those small things, we do have the money um, in the budget in order to fix those. And so you'll see the 169000 in expenses that aren't related to the length of the season um, that we would incur if we, we determined that we would open. Um, so the, um, the last thing in here is that although water is not an expense um, in our budget, we don't show it as a line item. It's not something that, that we um, show when you, when you look at the big pools budget, but we do track that internally. And it's a three, $307 a day production cost um, every day that we have water in the facility because we're losing those 200,000 gallons. Um, and so I also added into this memo for all of you to see is the um, admission numbers for the 2016, 2017, and 2018 seasons. Those are for 124, 24 days of water in the facility and 83 swimming days. And so you'll see the average daily totals that go along with those, those um, full season admissions. 
I'm happy to answer any additional questions that you have or anything um, that I may have uh, glossed over that you, you would like a further explanation on. Um, but at this time, we're just asking you to um, give staff direction on how you want us to handle this 2020 season. So this is Mayor Unruh, commissioners. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions for Jennifer or um, anything in the report you wanna highlight? This is Mayor Andrew. I will I will say I did reach out to um, through Facebook to to get some input and you know I've had input both ways. Some people texted and and messenger, but I you know it's really kind of if and give. I one of the questions I had Jennifer is I know that with the cleaning like the restrooms, you know I'm concerned about the restrooms and then some of the equipment. I mean how often you know I and I have not I tried to find the recommendations and I I didn't do a good enough job. Um, but how often those things are going to, have to be wiped off and, you know, benches and the, the lounge chairs. And so that staff time and those kind of things, I'm curious about, you know, if you had any thoughts on that before. Um, when we had our call last week, it was obviously um, just ahead of the governor of Kansas uh, releasing her phase plan. So the call was a little bit out of time, I guess. We do have another one coming up this Thursday in, in that I hope, but the CDC and the Red Cross both tried to give some recommendations on that plan. And so long as we're in the social distancing phase, the, the recommendation um, is masks for lifeguards, masks for um, uh, patrons, unless they're in the water. There was also a suggestion um, for masks while you're in the water. Apparently the Waterman um, group makes a mask um, that can be worn. And so we could provide those um, as part of their um, uniform um, for them to wear. Obviously, we also discussed how that might impact a quick save. If someone were to be wearing a mask and they jumped in and they were trying to then do um, uh, rescue, that becomes somewhat of a problem, but they, you know, then we've got to have that close contact. So how do you, how do you offset that? And is a lifeguard a fearful to do that, that kind of saving? We haven't received any feedback like that, but that was definitely one of the things that was on the call. Um, lots of cleaning. Um, they, the CDC talked about the belief that at certain chlorination levels, um, you know, the virus wouldn't necessarily be as problematic. However, we cannot say um, from, from what we've done that we're, we're meeting those levels. And the CDC was not going to, um, of course, comment on any one facility meeting those requirements. So they said it's really important that we not only disinfect um, regularly, um, but that we also that it be cleaned first and then disinfected, that it's really important that services be cleaned. And so I think that would be, we would almost have to dedicate some staff every day to just going around and keeping the facility cleaned and, and disinfected, especially in areas of high traffic, like the concession stand counters, um, tables where people might be sitting, lounge chairs, um, handrails, um, the area going up the slides, we would have to take precautions there. Um, and so long as the six, di six foot social distancing thing is in place, we would need markers on um, the area near the concession stand and we would need markers on the slide so that people could stand apart from one another. Um, and we would just have to have a lot of signs and postings uh, about that social distancing aspect until we get into um, the phase where it's no longer um, problematic or, or they believe it will be no longer problematic, which doesn't have a definite timeline. So that, we don't know when that, that would be for sure. Thank you. Any other questions for Jennifer? Or? I kind of just have a comment. Um, this is Commissioner Ortiz on, I know right now is just our, is, it's in our best interest to protect people and everyone around us. And I know it's, you know, just personally, I, I wouldn't take to the big pool just in this state. and. And in a construction point of view, if we were open, you got all this water leakage when you construct or deconstruct the, the concrete that's there. In my perspective, you're gonna have like holes, you know, you're gonna have to wait that prolongs the process or you know, your demolition part. So I mean, I think it's in my point of view, just smart to be ahead of the ball and um probably just not have a season. Um, I, I just, I, I feel that in a lot of, our, our negatives outweigh our positives in this scenario. So I think we just have to do our best to protect everyone and, and stay safe. 
any other comments? This is this is Marin, right? You know, this is um, it's a the, the pool holds a special place for me. I mean, and I, I know we really worked on to have a last kind of a saying goodbye to the pool. So I mean, you know, it's it's not purely financial. I mean, so I uh, I want to make sure that there are competing values here, um, but just make sure that we we voice those competing values so that we can really make a good decision as a commission. Any any other comments? One thing I'd say is. Is I feel like it might be a little bit premature to cancel the season. I just, if you think how it's playing out, I see how it's completely conceivable that we would end up canceling the season. But at the same time, it seems like there's enough time. There's nothing that we need to do right now that says we need to know right this meeting if it's going to have a season or not. Um, so in, in, in two weeks from now, I think we're going to learn a lot more about our community and the state where, where, where we're all at. So it, it does seem to me a little bit premature, but at the same time, I can completely foresee a, a scenario where there's not going to be a good time to open the season just because of the way that it looks like it's, it's rolling out. So that's my thoughts. This is Commissioner Euler. I do have a question, Jennifer. How do you think um, you'll be able to enforce the social distancing rule? I mean, you know, lifeguards tend to, I mean, seasonal employees and stuff. And so I guess I have a concern there as to whether or not we'd even be able to enforce it if we do have those uh, measures in place. That's a great question, question Commissioner Euler. Um, you know, it's difficult. Seasonal staff does their best. And of course, you always have like super stellar um, seasonal staff who go above and beyond. And if you ask them to clean the railing 10 times and not get close to anyone, they're going to do exactly what you ask. Um, and then you have the ones that uh, if you ask them to clean it, it might get cleaned on the third day. But you know, it, it's just really dependent on um, the accountability of staff. And I do, I do believe that I would have to, um, along with the, the pool manager, would have to spend some serious time having discussions with our seasonal staff to ingrain in them how important it is that we both follow the social distancing that has been set out and that we are cleaning everything on the schedule that's out um, without miss. And um, I think we would probably have to put some, some things in place to um, – to handle that, my biggest concern is um, it's difficult for young people to police other young people. Um, and we find that even um, with normal policies, whether that be the slides, whether that be um, jumping from places that they're not supposed to jump or um, going off the diving boards when they can't swim or, you know, whatever it may be, um, young people do struggle with that. Um, policing their own peers. And so I do think that there is some difficulty in that, but my hope is that um, we could we could find that those that would use the facility would be would hopefully be respectful also. Yeah, this is Mayor Unger. I, I, I do, and I, and I, Commissioner Dick, I appreciate that, the idea about maybe waiting for the decision. I, I only, with young people, I, or, you know, with the, the guards who are hired, um, I know that if we don't have a season, then, delaying that would be hard for them to find another i just don't want them to try not to not to have a summer job and so i don't know what that job market would look like i mean i know that i spoke with jennifer and she has said most of the staff who's already committed are, are wanting to come and would commit to us but i i'm wondering if we wait longer would that impact their ability to get another job somewhere else and um i would that would be hard for me to for them a lot of them this is their their money that they work all season so and Mayor, just to piggyback off of what you said, we do have them um, waiting. Uh, we're getting a lot of um, feedback from them that they they are waiting to hear what we are going to do one way or the other. And so um, we do want to let all of them know and have told them, that, um, and I'll be reaching out to them um, to let them know what your decision is for those that aren't able to listen today. Any other questions or comments on this on this issue? Commissioner Cessna here. Um, so the rollout for the governor's plan, the phased rollout, uh, phase one has a maximum of 10 people at a gathering uh, from May 19th to June 1st is a maximum of 30 people at a gathering. And that's when the pools will be able to open uh, in the state. 
phase three is June 2nd through June 15th. And that has a maximum of 90 people at one place at a gathering. And then from June 16th to June 30th um, is to be announced, depending how the how this all really plays out um, and the what we see on you know flattening the curve in the state and what happens locally as well um, and getting the recommendations from our health department. You know, we discussed last time and voted to keep the pill open kind of as the last uh, celebration. Uh, it, it's one of the iconic features of our community. Um, we do have uh, kids that are looking at um, as a place of employment. We also have uh, kids that have been um, at home uh, as part of the uh, stay at home. Uh, and I think if we open the pool, that would give people an opportunity to get out and give those kids a place to go and uh, participate in activities or get out of the house to go somewhere. Um, those are my thoughts. Um, and we're following, and then we're following state guidelines. It's not where we're going to have this mass um, amount of people. We'll have to follow the state guidelines in the phases moving up and then uh, whatever the local health authority um, directs us to do as well. Thank you. And those are my comments. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Cessna. I, I know, uh, Jennifer, I did put a call into oh, a couple other pools and they have not made a decision. I know they're waiting on uh, area pools here too. But have you been able to spoke to any area pools? I mean, I was wondering, so if we don't have our pool open, are there gonna be options within say 30 to 60 miles for people to swim? Mayor Unger, I don't know that for sure. Um, most of the conversations that I had were with, um, there were other people on the calls um, and smaller, some of the smaller communities, not around us, but um, smaller communities on the other side of the state were having this discussion at the same time we were. Um, same thing with the first class cities. The only one um, that I'm aware of that has for sure made the decision is Manhattan um, and the rest were taking it to their commissions this week. Um, the discussions were ranged every, everywhere from um, where I believe, you know, some of the cities saying that they believe that there would not be a season two, uh, that it would only be open for uh, like one-on-one -on -one or small group swimming lessons, um, things like that. And so I think it's all over the place. And I think that so many of us that are actually on the working side of the facility, um, we can have all of the, the thoughts or concerns or questions about the season. Um, that we want, but really most of us are looking um, to our governing bodies, whether that be a city commission, a county commission, a private board, um, to provide some guidance on on what uh, is in the best interest of the public. Any other comments or questions before we? This is Commissioner Euler again. So Jennifer, what would be the shortest season that you could um, anticipate? I know that um, kind of to piggyback what uh, Commissioner Cessna was talking about, um, we're not even in phase one yet um, with the Finney County Health Department's recent um, emergency um, declaration. And so what does our timeline look like for us to even get to those phases? Um, if I could tell you, someone might pay me a lot of money um, if I could tell you what that looks like. Um, but yeah, you're right. We don't know. And that's why we don't have any dates in here for you because I don't think staff is sure about um, when we could open. Um, I will note that the, the comments that uh, Commissioner Cessna made about the numbers of mass gatherings, those actually don't apply to the public pool. So we won't be limited to 30 people. We won't be limited to 90 people. Um, when we get to those phases, we would be able to um, have as many people into our facility as we could, as long as we kept them in, gr in groups smaller than 30. We couldn't allow 30 people to gather in one area to be policing them um, to keep their six foot distance during that phase and 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 all of that um, when we get there i don't know um, obviously a lot of areas across the state not all of them are open and into phase one we are not um, and obviously we would have to wait until we got into um, phase two in order to be able to do that um, but realistically, it's going to take some time um, because normally, as you all are aware, we have, would have started pool training and pool preparation um, more than a month ago. 
um, and we would have had uh, all of the, the facility ready to go. And because of the, the orders that have been in place and the things that have been going on, we haven't been able to do that. So those things are gonna take us some time anyways. So going to what do you think the shortest season is? Um, I, I don't know that there is a, a deadline. You know, if you said, okay, well maybe we could be there by the middle of June. Um, I think that's what we played the nine week scenario off of that we could have water in it before that. Um, and then, you know, have like a nine week season ending on August 9th, um, presuming that school would then start and we would go, we would begin demolition and all of those sorts of things. Um, but obviously if orders were still in place and there were things happening in our community that um, didn't allow us to do that, then it would be pushed off um, longer. So Jennifer, the other comment I wanted to ask or a question or maybe a comment, this idea about, um, this is Mayor Unruh. So if we gave the additional time, do we gain any additional money? And I don't know if Todd is still on or would that give any additional money with, with Confluence or them, would that save anything? Or, and I know the boring that we just voted for um, that that could be a deal breaker anyway. So, I mean, I'm understanding there are things that beyond our control, but I'm just curious if that gives them any advantage or us cost savings or anything like that. Yeah. So there's a couple of things I did talk. Um, I talked, uh, with them before today, but then I visited with both Terry and Todd this morning to ask some more questions of them in preparation of what you might ask of me. Um, and in talking to both of them, there, there's a couple of things for us to think about. One is that they they both had um, they had both um, noted that our previous seasons didn't end until Labor Day, which is what they had based all of their their information off of. And when I told them that no, this season we we had planned to to end when school started because of the water loss and all of the things, and to get started on the new project so that we could open for next year, they were really excited that they had gained that month. Um, they said that that was going to be uh, really important to have those nice weather days to do the things that they need to do in order to start laying the groundwork to get to our opening day. Um, I asked them specifically about what our seat, how uh, us being open or closed might impact. And they said, of course, there's, there's always things that once we get contracts and once we get everything signed, um, you know, things like demolition can start and they can begin working on things. One of the things that uh, Commissioner Dick brought up, which was um, putting the uh, chemical building in another location so that we could get started on some of the outside things sooner. Um, we just, those may have additional costs in order for us to get started sooner. We do have a short window um, in order to get this project done as you, as you saw on um, McCowan Gordon's timeline when they built uh, the facility in Dodge, it was 15 months. Um, well, if we have, ours is going to be less than that. Um, ours is going to be uh, closer to nine months. Um, and so every month we gain, of, of course, gives us um, more pressure to put on people. The one thing that um, McCowan Gordon said to me this morning that I thought was really interesting was that um, they're able to use smaller uh, contractors, so subcontractors locally, um, they're able to use smaller uh, guys to do certain types of work if they have more time. If they're on a tighter deadline, then they have to go after bigger companies sometimes that can perform uh, with 30 or 40 people a task so they can get it done in a day or two days. Whereas if they have additional time, then they can go after a smaller group um, and have them have a little more time. So he said, those are the things that affect time more so than um, uh, anything else. Jennifer, before, this is Matt Allen, city manager, before they start the construction, we saw the bar graph that had, it was orange that was construction. Uh, and then there was the blue that was pre-construction. Um, and they said, well, there was some overlap. I would imagine there's some pre-construction things that have to happen before you do construction. What's the realistic time frame if, of what, if the commission's under the pressure, the impression that closing the 2020 season gives them additional, uh, gives the contractors additional time, what are the things that still haven't been done yet in pre-construction that would have to be done before construction even began? And then what is then the realistic savings? Uh, you, you know, are they saving literally the three months we're talking about between now and the first part of August, or are they saving two months, one month, two weeks, no time at all? 
So you're between now and the date that we have that the um, the August 9th, which would normally be the closure, we're only talking of two months of swimming anyways. We're talking basically around the first part of June to around the end of July. And, and the pre-con stuff that include finalizing the design um, and then what the, the CMAR is going to do is going to go out and bid the products so that we know that our design is on um, target with our budget. Those are the things that would happen along with us getting all the final documents in place on our side. And so I really think that probably all you're going to gain is maybe, so let's say that we didn't have a season. Um, they might be able to start demolition in July, which would, which would mean you're gaining a, maybe two or three weeks um, on what, the, what they would have if we close on, on August 9th. And then that also assumes that when McCallum Gordon goes out and uh, uh, strikes a deal with that contractor, that that contractor is going to then immediately mobilize as well. Correct. Hey, Mayor, this is Commissioner Ortiz. I, I don't want to. I don't want everyone to think that this is a matter of our decision making on purely just the concept of the pool. I, uh, this is a matter of. Do we open the pool or do we close the pool in the safety of our community? I all the things where the pool is the trouble. But I think for this matter, it should just be focused on our community, our kids, our families to swim. Um, I know this is a tough decision, and I was one who was on board of keeping the pool open earlier when we decided to keep it open for one more season. I know that's kind of changed my heart a little bit just for the fact that my, I think my family comes um, first in safety as well as the community and, and all of your families. So I don't, I, I feel like we're kind of going off track a little bit, but these are good discussions, but I think our focus should be on, uh, on our safety. Thank you. And Commissioner Ortiz, we, we missed a little bit of um, your, oh, internet, I, we didn't hear everything the, in the kind of the very first part of that. I knew, I know the safety is the issue. Is there anything else that you want, would want to repeat? Well, yeah, I just wanted to stress that, you know, when we're talking about all this, I know it's, it's relevant, and, and, but I don't want to make this a matter of the construction of the big pool. This is This item here would be something that reflects our safety and our kids and our families. So... Um, I just wanted to make sure that it's stressed that we're not focusing here on the development of a pool where this should be an item we're considering for the safety and health of our community, of our family, of my kids, of your kids. And so I didn't want anybody to think that while we're thinking about shutting the pool down, this isn't something that it's correlating with the construction of, which, you know, very well, it's, it's relevant information, but I think we should just let people know, let the community know that our focus more is on the safety and health. Yeah, this is Mayor Andrew. Thank you for those comments. This is Mayor Andrew. One thing that I thought about is, is, is I was thinking about, you know, um, part of the issue with the zoo was keeping everything clean and safe and also for the workers. And um, even, I mean, though, even though most of the lifeguards are younger, um, I, I think um, that was one of the things I was trying to figure out, you know, at the zoo we closed because there was, how could we keep everything wiped off and keep everything clean and making sure for, um, you know, people, I mean, even though I, I think the zoo would, I'm like Commissioner Cessna, the zoo had been a great respite from being inside and being outdoor. And, but I mean, I know we closed the zoo as a, as a decision of safety. And so, um, like I said, there's a lot of competing values here for me. Um, and I, this is not an easy decision and I don't, I don't think it's dollar wise at all. I think it's more, there's a lot more to this. So any, any other great discussion, any, anything else? Celan, is there anything from the public that, um, or anything that you, that we need to get capture of questions? I don't want to, this is important. I know to a lot of people. So. Um, there was one comment um, that Atchison and Effingham have closed their pool. Or will not be opening, I'm sorry. And I received a comment that Holcomb is making the decision on Monday. Okay, yeah. I, I called Holcomb and asked, and so. 
And this is Commissioner Ortiz again. I think, I mean, waiting for other people to make an announcement, we, we are very capable of making our own decisions for our own community, so. Okay, with that, do we have any further discussion or further comments? If not, I'll call for a motion. Commissioner Ortiz, I'll make a motion to not open the pool for the remaining season of this 2020 year. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? So the motion dies for lack of a second. Do we have, um, so again, any further discussion before we call for another motion? I just would like to reemphasize that I, I think that we don't know enough right now to make this call. And it is very possible that in a week or two, this will be an obvious decision to make. Um, but right now, it doesn't seem like we have enough information to, to make this call. So this is Mayor Under Commissioner Dick. Would you like to table this decision to the next um, to the next meeting? I mean, that is an option. But I mean, again, staff, your or, or people are waiting. So I'm just I'm curious about if that if that's an option. Um, that that does it make a difference, Jennifer? That is tabling. I mean, it's, that to me, tabling is the same thing as express to intent. Is there a difference between the two for operations? Uh, I don't know. I would say that it's, it leaves, if we don't make a decision one way or the other, um, then staff would just, I guess, be waiting another two weeks or whenever you guys would like to hear this again, um, to make a decision one way or the other, which puts off, uh, the period of time in which we let staff know. And also the period of time in which we start getting the facility ready one way or the other, because obviously, um, putting 2 million gallons of water in the pool and then beginning to pump 200,000 gallons a day um, into it to keep it full, um, we would want to make sure that we were going to have a season in order to do that. So um, I think we would just be kind of hanging back and waiting um, to hear from you all uh, either at the next meeting or, or whenever you asked us to bring it back before you. I can, I can see that though. So then I would, I would then think about tabling it just because I don't want to give the go ahead and fill up the big pool. And then in two weeks, we're like, well, never mind. Um, if that delays that. The other um, thing to consider is that uh, if we, some staff, it won't matter for, I think, I think you'll have some staff will wait um, for you to make your decision, but um, if we let them know that it may be another two weeks before we have an answer, and then it may be another period of time after they're ready to go, um, they may, some of them may stick with us and some of them may um, opt for another job somewhere else. So uh, this is Mayor Andrew. Randy, is there a way to table something? I mean, I understand all the implications of tabling. So, but I mean, Randy, is there a way to do this that a proper way to do that. I, my concern about going ahead and, and doing that intent is again, this idea that knowing where we're at, you know, that we are not, we're into that order from our local health officials and knowing that that could impact, you know, our opening if we don't get past that 14 days, so. Sure, Mayor, this is city attorney, Russell. Uh, somebody can make a motion and a second to table it to the next meeting so that staff is directed to have this back on the agenda for the next, regular meeting. Thank you. So I'm going to call for a motion again and we'll try this again. I'll move that we table this and bring it back in two weeks. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? This is Commissioner Euler. I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. And I'll go ahead and again, I or nay. So Commissioner Cessna. Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Nay. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Mayor Andrew? I'm nay. Okay, thank you so much. I know this is a difficult issue. Um, it will be brought back. Uh, so it passes three to two to be tabled for the next two weeks.
and we will see where we go from there. So, uh, city manager, I would love a break. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody else needs one, but that is a lot of pool, and I don't know if it's the suggestion of water, but I could really use a one function break. Yeah, uh, we could uh, we can break now. By my clock, it says three thirty nine. And reconvening at three forty five. That would give us five minutes. So a little more. That would be. Thank you. That would be very appreciated. Thank you. All right, we'll resume at item twelve D at three forty five.
here. And I'm sorry, this is Melina Mays trying to trying to. Uh, Show by my clock is 345, so we'll go ahead and um, come back, call the city commission back to order from our brief break. Thank you so much for taking a break. I was able to go grab my, my uh, binder for the um, budgeting. So, Matt. Thank you, Mayor. The uh, item, I, I think we have a, an item before the, the, the budget yes. or a couple items before oh, the budget. 12D, uh, the governing body is asked to consider and approve the, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to share my screen and scroll at the same time. Uh, the governing body is asked to consider and approve revisions to the water conservation and drought response plan as part of the annual review process outlined in the plan. I'm going to turn this over to Water Resource Manager Fred Jones to present. I will say before he starts, this would typically be an item that we do under the consent agenda, but it would also be an item that typically we probably would have had a, uh, in the last two months, would have had a pre-meeting on this topic. Uh, generally, kind of water conservation, uh, it, it's one of the themes heading into the summer uh, for uh, a pre-meeting that we try to touch, uh, especially since this is one of the articulated goals uh, of the commission is, is uh, uh, issues related to water quantity and water quality. Uh, we try to address those in a comprehensive pre-meeting. And so uh, because we don't have that luxury this year with all that we're going through, uh, I asked Fred to put together uh, a, a short overview of this uh, response plan. And so Fred, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I want to bring up my notes so uh, you're not looking at the top of my head. Um, <laughs> and in continuing with our theme of the afternoon, um, we've been doing this water supply plan. Uh, it's our water conservation and drought response plan for the city of Garden City. We've been uh, reviewing this with the city commission for the last four or five years every year. and. Uh, we try to do it at the, either the last meeting in April or the first meeting in May. So the reason we do that, uh, KDHE requires that public water supplies uh, have a water conservation and drought response plan in place. And, and we're developing a response framework to ensure that we have continuity of water supply for the consumers in Garden City. Uh, the plan, uh, which is attached to your packet, uh, is broken down into four sections. Uh, the introduction uh, describes what the, the city's uh, supply resources, storage facilities, and infrastructure uh, are made up of. And uh, it also uh, incorporates information uh, from the 2014 water system master plan. Now, that master plan um, was developed by PEC, and currently they are updating that master plan as well. So um, before the end of the year uh, in 2020, uh, we should have an update uh, for the commission uh, on the, uh, the master plan in its newest iteration. And that's being done just because of the, the amount of infrastructure that's been added to the city in the last few years and the businesses and, and industries that uh, we are uh, pursuing as a city. 
The next section describes the uh, water consumption history for the city. And uh, we're using the most uh, recent regional data. So as a region, uh, the state of Kansas is keeping track of water usage. And uh, Matt, I don't know if you're able to scroll in the commission packet to page five of the plan. There's a chart on page five uh, that gives you an idea of uh, the city's water usage as compared uh, to the region. And I'll wait just a second for him to get there. Right there, Matt. Um, so uh, the most recent regional average um, ends in 2017. So probably sometime this year we'll get 2018 data. Um, and the, the city's average usage during the last five years in this regional picture, which is 2013 to 2017, um, the city's average gallons per capita day, so that's how many gallons of water a person uses per day in Garden City, is 171 gallons. Regionally, our average is 212 gallons per capita day. So the city is performing above uh, where the region is at, and our usage is about 19% lower than that regional average. Uh, since the city's average usage uh, has declined, this year when we updated the plan, we've set a new gallons per capita day goal in the plan uh, not to exceed that 171 gallons per capita day. And again, that's just a goal. It's uh, something for us to be thinking about uh, as we move forward. We don't want to set that goal aggressively low. Um, we, I kind of use that as a, as a benchmark to see uh, where we've been in the past few years. Uh, we used to have that goal was set at 175 gallons per capita day. Um, now, since, uh, since 2017, we've seen our water usage reduce even a little bit more. So in 2018, we were as low as 160 gallons per capita day uh, for water usage. Uh, we've seen that kind of buoy back up a little bit in 2019, and the average is uh, 165 gallons per capita day. Uh, so, and, and just to spend just a minute more talking about how that number is calculated, the gallons per capita day is all the water used within the city of Garden City. It's not, it does not count water used for industrial purposes. It does not include water that is uh, sent to other systems. It's just water used within the city of Garden City. And it also includes water used at any city facility. So what we would call non-revenue water, thing, uh, water resources used at cemetery parks, swimming pools, that number is calculated into that gallons per capita day number as is the city's water loss. And so, all those numbers go together. They're divided by the, the population in the city. And we divide that number by 365 to get that usage per day. So a person, uh, if, if Fred Jones gets up this morning, he isn't necessarily going to use 171 gallons himself. But collectively, as a member of the community, that's the number, that's the gallons that are used per day. Uh, the section, the second section also talks about actions that we're taking to address educating the community regarding water use and programs uh, that the water department is develop developing or implementing to help us achieve increased water conservation. And those are outlined in there. We update those every year, depending on where we're at. A number of those steps we've already implemented. Uh, one new step that we've added this year is uh, the city, we're participating in uh, a benchmarking survey with the American Water Works Association. And so uh, that participation in that survey will allow us to compare the utilities operations as a whole to other utilities all over the United States. And uh, because water is a universal um, commodity, it also includes uh, how we handle our wastewater uh, resources as well. So um, it's water and wastewater uh, is included in 
that survey. And so next year, uh, we'll have some input from uh, the outcome of that survey, and hopefully that can help us make suggestions to the governing body regarding future policies on water. The third, the third section of the uh, plan discusses our drought response, and this is um, this section defines circumstances that will trigger varying levels of action uh, to help reduce water consumption to a level that ensures a continuity of service for the citizens. Uh, the three levels of drought response action are water watch. Uh, that's the most uh, basic level of conservation. Water warning uh, is, again, the next um, most in, uh it, that's increasing the importance of the need for conservation. And then finally, uh, we have water emergency. So when you get into uh, water emergency, that's where um, it's uh, more and more regulatory oversight, uh, stopping any waste of water. There's potential there that certain uses of water would be prohibited. So that's a, it's a very serious uh, element of a conservation plan and one that as a community we hope we don't ever uh, get into. Um, and the response levels are progressive, but there it also needs to be, there needs to be some consideration that there may be a time when a city would declare a water emergency, say after a natural disaster, if we have a tornado or some kind of serious uh, power outage where where you know, due to weather, storms, earthquake, you name it, where our ability to produce water is um, rapidly diminished. And so that would be an occasion where you'd be utilizing uh, water emergency as a way to ensure that we have adequate supplies of drinking water for uh, sustaining life and providing proper sanitation for the citizens. Uh, and then the last section of the plan uh, outlines the practices of the city to monitor water consumption. And it defines how we uh, review the plan and update it each year. And so this, this presentation is one example of how we do that. Another example of how we communicate uh, the plan to the public uh, is through activities like Drinking Water Week, which we're currently involved in, and also the customer water use reports, which uh, folks in Garden City, uh, most of them have probably already received those in the mail. So the, um, those efforts are, are things we're doing to provide more information to customers, to educate them about their water use, and uh, help them determine if there are ways uh, that they can collectively uh, conserve water and help uh, preserve our commodity, our most valuable commodity. So. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm here to answer those. So, uh, Brad, this is Mayor Unruh. I know that uh, there was a water uh, a water warning or something. There was a, a oil notice out at um, Towns Riverview. Um, now, are those, are those, do those like come as part of the, or is that just where they noticed something was wrong with the water and then you guys had to determine a, uh, an action? It's uh, a good question. Uh, Towns Riverview is actually a water public water supply independent of the City of Garden City. Oh, okay. The City of Garden City is the wholesale provider of water to that system, and we have visited with KDHE about that boil water advisory in Towns Riverview. It is not due to um, any issue with the supply of water that they're receiving from the City of Garden City. It is uh, in regard to uh, hydraulic situation within that water supply. They're having difficulty uh, distributing that water throughout their system at the appropriate pressure. And it's uh, probably due to some hydraulic issues within their system or a failure of their pumping system. Okay, no, thank you. I, I noticed that. I also noticed on Facebook, your recent uh, drink from the tap. That was, that's kind of a cool, yeah, that was a really nice. One, so, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Fred? Uh, 
Well, thank you. We'll miss seeing you in person, but hopefully next year. And yes, I did get my notice and no, I don't want to talk about it right now, but we can visit about that later, Mayor. <laughs> thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. This does require a, uh, a, uh, an action by the governing body to approve the revisions, if you're so inclined. So we'll stand for a motion. Ms. Commissioner Sessna, I make a motion we approve the uh, revisions to the water conservation and drought response plan as presented. This so is we have a motion. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, aye or, or nay. Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Mayor Unruh, aye. Thank you, Fred. So it passes five to zero. Thank you again. Thanks, Fred. Happy birthday. <laughs> you and a commissioner share a birthday. We'll guess which yeah. one here in a little while. Yep, yep, yep. yep. All right, the next, uh, the next item on the agenda, Mayor and Commissioners 12E, the governing body is asked to consider and approve uh, following applications for emergency loans using community development block grant, economic development revolving loan funds held by the city. Uh, Finney County Economic Development Corporation, Lana Duvall will present this agenda item. Item E doesn't necessarily require action. Um, that's our opportunity to talk globally about the uh, this program and our use of the CDBG funds this way, give you an update on, on things. The actual applications are items 12F through 12J. There's uh, five proposals before you at this meeting. So this is a little bit of a um, uh, forced structure by uh, the Novus Agenda system to, to do it in this way, but uh, it helps accommodate your uh, consideration of these individually. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lana to talk about the CDBG Emergency Loan Applications Program, and then we'll go through items F through J, which are the specific uh, loan requests by the businesses. Lana. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yes, thank you. Excellent. All right. So uh, first of all, we'll clear up a little bit of confusion in the documents that are that are in your agenda. <clears throat> we have had a couple of changes to application uh, amounts. And so first of all, I'll point out that Berta's uh, Flowers and Festivals uh, has been reduced back from their request of $25,000 down to what they qualify for as, uh, as a half of an FTE. They would they qualify for seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. So we've adjusted that amount downward. Uh, so that with that change, that leaves the available balance after today's um, considerations at forty one thousand five hundred. Uh, additionally, um, I received word from Pinkies, which uh, the Pinkies Grilled Cheesestro application you approved at your last meeting. Uh, they were able to secure the PPP financing through their bank and secured a grant. And because of that, they reached out and said they would like to uh, return their funds and make them available to other businesses who may have a, a need beyond what they have currently. So that those funds should be coming back in as well, which would take you to a remaining balance of around 56,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. So. Um, apologies for this being uh, not not the correct information in your uh, in your report from us, but that that was changed after the fact. So uh, my apologies for that. Uh, are there any questions related to that? No. Th th this is Mary Andrew. Thank you so much for giving us those updates, and that's really that's a neat situation with Pinkies. Thank you. Yes, it is. It's 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 very neat that they're that they're uh, interested in helping other businesses if they can. So that's very nice. Uh, I would also tell you that we do have the Kansas Department of Commerce looking into the opportunity to allow county CDBG funds to be used within the city limits. Um, so right now, uh, there's um, we believe it is an administrative rule in place where they, they don't like for the county funds to be used within the incorporated city if the incorporated city has a loan fund of their own. However, 
uh, since, as you can tell, your funds have been going very, very well, and we're very thankful that we're able to get them out there. Um, there, there certainly appears that there could be an opportunity to utilize their funds um, better if, if they're able to do that within um, the city. So uh, we have their legal counsel at the Department of Commerce looking into that, and we'll certainly uh, let you know what the end result of that is. I did make the county commission aware of that yesterday morning at their meeting as well. So if there's no further questions on the process itself, we'll move on to the individual um, loan applications that are before you today. The first of those. Any I'm questions? Sorry? Nope, go ahead, Lana. Thank you so much. I was just looking yeah. for questions. Thank no you. problem. Uh -huh. All right, so the first of those applications is Virtus Flowers and Festivals. Again, that is a one half FTE and qualifies at $17,500. Any discussion on this one? Commissioner Sussna makes the motion to approve the application as in the loan as presented. There is a second. Chair Dick, I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. Let's go through the roll. Any further discussion? So roll call, Commissioner Sessna. Aye. Commissioner Ortiz. Aye. Commissioner Euler. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. And Mayor Unruh, aye. Thank you. Motion carries five to zero. Great, the second application is DS Hospitality. Uh, this is more uh, more readily known as the Magnuson Hotel mm -hmm. and their application is in the amount of 35,000 with two full-time equivalencies retained. Any questions? Call for a motion. Commissioner Cessna makes the motion to approve the application and loan as presented. It's been moved, do we have a second? Commissioner Ortiz, I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. Roll call. So Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. And Mayor Unruh, aye. Passes five to zero. The next item is Fulton's Founders Inc., um, otherwise known as Flat Mountain Brew House. Their request is for $35,000, 17.5 FTEs retained. Any discussion on this one? Call for a motion. I move that we approve the request as presented. So it's been moved. Do we have a second? I'll second, Commissioner Euler. So it's been moved and seconded. So we'll roll call. Any further discussion? Roll call, Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. And Mayor Unruh, aye. Thank you. Passes five to zero. Thank you. The next application is Las Margaritas. They've requested $35,000 and they have five. I, I'm sorry, Lana, we lost that last part of it. Mayor, it appears her feet is, has frozen. I'll take it from here. Uh, okay. The uh, request to item 12i is from Las Margaritas. They have five full-time equivalent jobs retained. Uh, the request is for $35,000. Any comments or questions? I'll call for a motion. Ms. Commissioner Ortiz, I'll make the motions to approve an application from Las Margaritas for the Community Development Block Grant in the loan amount of $35,000. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Ken Dick, I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. Roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. And Mayor Unruh, aye, passes five to zero. I think we have Lana back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the last one is VHC Performance and Repair, $35,000 for FTEs. Any, any comments or questions? If not, I'll hold for a motion, call for a motion. This is Commissioner Euler. I'll make a motion to approve an application from VHC Performance for a Community Development Block Grant for $35,000. We have a second. Commissioner Ortiz, second. So it's been moved and seconded. Roll call. Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. And Mayor Unruh, aye. Passes five to zero. Thanks, Lana. Nice to have you back. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Mayor and commissioners, we're ready for uh, item 
12K. This is uh, the review of the budget. Uh, the funds that we'll be looking at today are the ones related to the uh, golf course, Fund 70. Uh, also, and that includes both the pro shop side and the maintenance side. And then uh, it also includes what's called the golf course building fund. Um, and then in, we'll look at two of our um, enterprise funds, solid waste, which is fund 75 and the drainage utility, which is fund 79. And those are the two utilities that fall under the umbrella of public works. Uh, so I'm gonna start out and go through um, at sort of a macro level, I would describe it as the, uh, the golf course uh, a budget. Uh, and then we have uh, Buffalo Dunes Pro Jason Hayes, and then also uh, our golf course, Buffalo Dunes Golf Course Superintendent Clay Payne available uh, and could answer questions if you have, uh, have them regarding specific line items. I'm going to try to get this before we start. I'm going to try to get this sized because I'm going to be scrolling and reading at the same time. Okay. Uh, the golf course, because this is not uh, a fund with a tax levy, um, the this uh, it shows uh, it, it shows this collection of income, but this is, this fund isn't a utility, uh, and I and the difference there is. Uh, while it's not a necessarily a tax supported fund, there is a tax fund to transfer into it, uh, which is a little bit confusing, but it, it, this operates as a, its own separate business unit outside of, uh, of the general fund. But we do transfer in on an annual basis, uh, two things that I would describe as tax sources. One is a transfer in from the general fund. Now the general fund is a collection of a lot of different uh, a lot of different revenue streams. Not all of them are taxes, but uh, certainly the bulk is through sales tax and property tax. And uh, we transfer in, uh, or budgeted to transfer in $375,000 uh, to help shore up this budget. Um, you, we work annually to bring that number uh, down as best we can. Uh, and there's some strategies uh, that I, I think Jason's described to you in past uh, 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 past interactions with the commission, whether it be uh, a pre-meeting or, or, uh, or, or presentations of, of their annual reports so that you, uh, that you can be comfortable with what they're undertaking, both from a revenue standpoint and an expense standpoint to try to um, level off this number, if not, uh, if not reduce it moving forward. There's also another one, and I'm going to highlight it here, 4010.17, the last income listed is called Special Rec and Park. Uh, the alcohol tax that's collected by the state of Kansas and distributed back to uh, local units of government um, is in thirds. One of the thirds it goes to um, what we know as the Alcohol Fund Advisory Committee. Its purpose is for alcohol uh, alcohol and substance abuse prevention or treatment. Another third goes to the general fund. And then there's a third that goes to what's called special parks and recreation. Now, those thirds are each around $100,000, some years a little bit more. And so of that $100,000 that's transferred to special parks and recreation, which, it's a, which is its own fund uh, in, our, in our fund accounting uh, hierarchy, uh, there's then a $40,000 transfer out to Buffalo Dunes Golf Course. So those two things added together, over $400,000 are what helps support about the, the, the million to a million one uh, revenue stream uh, required to operate Buffalo Dunes. Uh, outside of that, the major, uh, the major income streams are green fees, memberships, and cart rentals. Uh, it, maybe in fourth place, then concessions uh, and, and uh, concession revenue. So uh, several years ago, there was a strategy to move away from a uh, virtually total reliance on green fees to um, uh, stabilizing that with a real push towards memberships and even the creation of an all-inclusive membership 
uh, which we call gold memberships. And so uh, you, you can see our budget there. Uh, uh, it can be described a little bit as aspirational, I would say, um, but I think uh, uh, I think uh, Jason has has some good plans in place to try to reach those numbers. Uh, I'll let him comment more specifically on those um, uh, when I'm done running through it. But that's that's an overview of the income. Uh, the four major categories: green fees, memberships, uh, cart rental, and concessions, plus the two tax sources: uh, transfer from the general fund and special special parks and recreation. So out of that, we do two things. There's 7111, or, or I'm sorry, fund 7711, and then fund 7712. Uh, so one income stream, two expense budgets. One expense budget is the pro shop. The other expense budget um, is maintenance. Or uh, as you might think of it related to the staff, one of them that Jason directly, directly oversees and the other one that Clay directly oversees. So in the, uh, in the clubhouse side of things, the golf pro budget, uh, here we'll have um, the golf pro and assistant golf pro staff, and then the clubhouse staff, which would be uh, cart attendants and, uh, and clubhouse workers. Uh, that accounts for about a couple hundred, uh, about 200,000, as you can see, the request uh, um, in, uh, in here is uh, 190 or 200, uh, 200,250, a uh, little bit of an increase over um, what was approved in the 2020 budget. Um, you see the 2020 revision uh, um, shows that shows that a little bit lower, but uh, you know, by and large, um, by and large, really the same strategy there for uh, for Jason and how he's staffing the clubhouse. Uh, when we get into the contractual services. Uh, keep track of my columns here. Uh, really, this is, there's not going to be a lot of change from this year to year. This is a pretty lean operational budget. Um, the, uh, the big difference here is in repair buildings. And that is for um, an exterior facelift to the existing clubhouse. Uh, there, the, some of the, the, the stain, uh, the thing that, you know, protects the, uh, protects the wood um, is, is in need of repair. So um, an exterior repair, hopefully to bridge between now and, and sometime that we might be able to uh, uh, begin some serious work on a, on a new clubhouse fund, uh, you know, provided fundraising comes through. Uh, the, uh, down here, this, the largest number is concessions. Really, that's just directly corresponding to, we, we put the number here in expenses that we uh, anticipate will tie into the number that we're projecting for revenue. Uh, get kind of a cost of goods sold relationship there as well. So that's the that's an overview for the uh, the clubhouse budget. And I think now would be a good time to call a timeout and ask Jason uh, if there are some specific line items, Jason, that you'd like to highlight. And uh, also if the commission has any questions for uh, for the pro, uh, he'd be he'd be glad to answer those. I'm sure. Jason, are you there? Uh, yes, Mayor, Commissioners, I I am here. Okay, we can hear you. Go ahead, Jason. Yep. Um, the uh, the the things that will stick out, um, I, I think that we're trying to do is we're trying to hold expenses. Um, where they are based on actual numbers from 2019 and 2020. Um, uh, the, uh, there's some expenses in there that I think uh, we, there's some room to improve on. Um, a lot of that also, um, like we go up to our seasonal labor, um, a lot of that can be attributed to weather um, if the weather is good, like it has been this past year, January, February, March, uh, we're going to have, uh, we'll have seasonals uh, come on board a little earlier than, than normal. Um, also, uh, we've, we've kind of, one of the things that I presented in the pre-meeting was a possible rate increase uh, in 2020. 
and with everything going on with COVID and, and all of that, um, we decided to postpone that uh, and possibly look at that for 2020. Um, and uh, excuse me for 2021. Um, and so I, I think we're trying to operate as lean as we can. Um, and I think, I think we're doing a good job. Um, just, just kind of some quick numbers uh, year to date. Um, so you kind of know where we're at uh, for 2020. Um, rounds played year to date, we've had 3,422. Um, last year we did 2,827 as of the end of April. So we're up 595 rounds. Um, what, what's interesting for the month of April, we did 1,534 rounds uh, in 2020. In April of 2019, we did 1,781 rounds. But in that 1,781 rounds, we've done, we did uh, 342 college high school rounds, which are college practice and high school practice. And then we did 259 tournament rounds. Um, you subtract that out. Um, in, in 2020, we've done six rounds combined tournament and high school college. Uh, so member play for the month of April compared to last year was we were up uh, almost 500 rounds. Um, the other thing that is uh, is going on is we're as of today we're about plus 18 memberships year to date compared to where we were at this time last year. Um, people are playing a lot more golf. Um, obviously, it's one of the one of the few places that they can get out and uh, enjoy some uh, recreation time away from all the craziness that everybody's having to deal with. Um, so people uh, people are playing lots of golf, um, and I, I see that uh, trend continuing uh, through May until we uh, get everything figured out and when we get kind of some some sort of uh, similar just back back open and everybody back and doing well and all that thanks jason uh any questions for uh for the pro i um i do want to just i i asked matt about how they did the golf carts and the fleet of carts and how we rotate that but i just I didn't want to say, I mean, I am really impressed with the way you take care of things at the golf course. The, the carts are, I mean, of course, when you use those, I mean, they're clean and well, they're really well done. And so I just want to say thank you for just the way you're maintaining the equipment. You can tell you're really squeezing the life out of everything you can. So I just, I wanted to say thank you and to you and, and, and Lauren and also play. So I think really good job on that. Kind of thank stuff. you, Mayor. Mayor, something else that, that I, I think is, uh, talks about a lot of how we operate out here um, at our uh, one of our weekly staff meetings with uh, Matt um, he suggested uh, we, we kind of concurred um, with not able to have water jugs and water out on the golf course um, um, we are actually starting to give water away to, to the participants uh, that come out and play um, just you know it just as a I, I think it's the right thing to do especially with when we have no water out on the golf course. Um, and uh, we start actually started that today and that's been a huge hit and uh, the golfers and members have really appreciated it. So um, I think it's just one of the little many things that uh, we do uh, as, as far as staff across the board, Clay's staff, uh, my staff, um, they've, they've done a great job in the last 45 days with, with all the COVID-19 stuff. And we've asked them to, uh, really jump through a lot of hoops and they have done a fantastic job. I can be more proud of, of the guys out, out here and, and what we've done. So great value added. Thank you. There aren't any other questions for Jason. We'll move to Clay's budget. Uh, th this budget is larger uh, than um, uh, than the than the than the pro shop side. Uh, it's uh, a, a couple of things that um, uh, are, are, uh, make, make that so. One, one is the staff, a little bit of difference in staffing, but then also a pretty sizable uh, 
uh, chemical, uh, chemical, chemical expense uh, and um, equipment expense. Mayor, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the taking care of equipment. Also, uh, in this budget is where the mechanic is paid for. And so while uh, certainly the card attendants and Jason staff do a lot, uh, will do a lot of good, um, good work keeping the exterior of the uh, carts uh, clean and well kept that uh, helps elongate the life of those carts. Um, certainly having an in-house mechanic that's able to work on those and the mowers. And uh, you talk about squeezing as much life out of a piece of equipment as, as we can. We not only squeeze life out of it, but it looks new for, uh, for several years. And so I think Clay can, uh, uh, Clay can reinforce that as, as well. But we've got, a, we've got a staff set up here. They, uh, um, certainly a veteran, uh, a veteran grounds crew uh, has been with us a long time. Even this, the, the seasonal uh, ones or part-time ones are, have been with us for a long time. We look at the, uh, the balance of the budget and you'll see that from year to year, this is the, not a lot of deviation, not a lot of change. Um, I will tell you, there's a tremendous amount of thought that goes into these budgets, even though it really looks like the 2020 line item just got minimally adjusted to the 2021 line item, but uh, within each of those line items, there's different strategies uh, and experimentations that take place and, and, and Clay's presented on those um, with you uh, uh, to, to make their operations more efficient. Um, really, Clay, I think I'm gonna have you highlight, um, I'd like you to touch on uh, chemical and maybe some of the strategies that uh, you're looking at in the herbicides line item and the uh, uh, um, the, the fungicide line item and, and then the overall uh, uh, what you're doing in the phases and whether or not they have 2021 budgetary impacts just kind of call attention to the line item since it's fresh in the commission's mind where you see some of those changes may be taken uh, uh, taken shape and also identifying those uh, um, those line items where you may find some savings that allow you to make some of the improvements in phase one. Sure. So, uh, Clay Payne, Golf Course Superintendent, Buffalo Dunes. Um, yeah, I just want to touch base. Initially, we talked about our mechanic and how wonderful he is. Um, uh, we, we don't have enough time for me to sit here and tell you how important he is to our operation. And um, that kind of is shown this year in the budget. I will get to um, some of those other items in a second, but we, we did adjust 2020 budget. Uh, we removed one piece of equipment. We have two rough mowers. Um, their expected life expectancy is about uh, 3,000 hours. They're currently both over 6,500 hours. <laughs> so. Uh, not only have we got a lot of life out of them, but they are also our most expensive piece of equipment. So for us to be able to um, more than double their, their life um, really is a testament to um, Mike and our entire operators um, that take care of our equipment on a daily basis. Um, we are asking for another fund in that equipment for 2021. Um, with the with some of the improvements and phasing that we've done, um, we've recently taken out one acre of irrigated grass, and Preston Martin has utilized that at uh, Valley View um, Cemetery. Um, so that sod is being utilized throughout the the city. I know the zoo used it as well. So um, not only are we um, limiting our inputs, but we're also helping beautify. Um, throughout the city as well. Um, as far as the impact of some of these changes, they may not be seen initially. There is some expense um, to growing in um, some of your native areas and um, those, we expect that to be a couple year um, situation, but once things are established, we we foresee especially fungicides, once the greens are implemented um, we expect that number to almost be cut in half um, just based on the new technology um, and genetics that are in these new turf varieties. So um, you may not see it as a budget savings now, but once established, um, 
not only will those savings be at that point, but it's every year past this 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 time now that we'll we'll see those savings. Are there questions for Clay? Hearing none, I want to uh, call your attention to golf course building fund. Once upon a time, um, if there was a member round, you paid an additional $2. Uh, wasn't a super popular thing among the membership. Uh, the, and then there was a portion of, uh, of green fees that went towards this. Now it's just administratively done and we section off a piece of the, the income that comes through and we transfer in a small percentage of that to hit the number. Um, so this is a, the, the name of this fund is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it, it's golf course slash building. Uh, this was to build improvements out on the course. Uh, I, I think generally was was the original idea. Um, we did some sponsorship of T signs as a revenue. We did the transfer in from fees as a revenue. Uh, but um, it, you know, my recollection, Clay, uh, you can verify this or correct me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, but if we were going to go build a a new trap or you know to even do some of the improvements that that uh, Clay's suggested. Uh, this would be a this would be a place for some source funding for those types of on course improvements. What this isn't is a fund to build a new clubhouse or a new literal building. Um, but, uh, that uh, while there's a talk um, uh, of that occurring at Buffalo Dunes, it's really through the Friends of Buffalo Dunes fundraising initiative that that would uh, that that would take place. So. Uh, as is the case on some other fund names. Um, as time goes on, uh, we're sort of using uh, using words that uh, could potentially have a dual meaning. And so uh, just for your situational awareness, this is a course improvements fund that's out there uh, that's available for um, uh, for Clay to use uh, for, for some on-course capital improvement. Clay, is that an accurate history in a, in a way you look at the use of this, these funds? Yeah, absolutely. Any questions on 071? All right, that wraps up the golf course budget. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Clay. Keep up the great work and appreciate you guys being open and um, being, uh, being um, respectful, well, offering, offering a, a recreation opportunity, but definitely being respectful of all that the uh, health professionals are advising you guys are practicing uh, uh, the way businesses should execute upon reopening. In my mind, I was out there on Sunday and all of your workers are, you know, gloved up, masked up, doing the right thing. No one's allowed in the building just as the commission had, had approved and you're doing a great job out there. Fund 75, uh, this is uh, the first of our utility funds. So the difference in between a utility fund and the fund with no tax levy, like we just uh, we just reviewed, is the revenues and expenses are going to balance out. Uh, this, this is going to operate uh, much like a business, and so the revenue, the income is going to be what we take in uh, through the operations of this utility, and we'll cover uh, we'll cover the expenses. Uh, income and solid waste, uh, which is the, the, the uh, refuse collection, garbage collection, uh, the, is, is pretty cut and dry. You've got a residential rate, you've got uh, a schedule of commercial rates based on the volume you need us to pick up and the frequency with which we pick it up. Uh, that times the number of accounts, it's pretty stable. It's not going to be fluctuating like water or like electric based on uh, some variables that, that nobody knows. By and large, we, uh, we can project very accurately what we're gonna bring in in solid waste. Uh, in, your, in your budget book, uh, but not on, on this slide is, is the, the rate projection. Um, the, the commission approved some time ago uh, a solid waste rate change with um, uh, with an annual incremental increase rather than waiting and then doing a big jump. Um, and so the revenue projections are based uh, specifically on that. And uh, we do have a uh, small budget income line item for recycling sales. 
uh, and um, although that pales in comparison to what we collect in, in just general solid waste, uh, in, in the general solid waste budget. So this recycling sales would be what we pay or what we get paid uh, for our product. Um, not everything we recycle has has a value, and so there are some things that while we get revenue for, there's other things that, um, you know, we're almost in the, the situation of paying them to take it away for us. Any questions on income before we get into the expenses? And then Andy Liebel, Public Works Director, Interim Public Works Director, is available to... Uh, uh, answer questions on these. I'll hit the highlights. 21 employees in the solid waste operations. Uh, the uh, our, our, uh, Most of these are going to be drivers. As you can see, uh, over half of the 21 total are, are, are drivers. We also uh, pay for the public works director position out of the solid waste utility. Um, while there is some uh, little or some general fund oversight, uh, operational oversight, um, utilities in a better situation uh, uh, to cover that expense. Uh, the, in the contractual line items, the big one that jumps out is the landfill charges. Uh, we are by far the largest customer of the landfill. And so uh, while we don't operate the landfill, uh, it's a private operation, um, you know, certainly we're, uh, we're tied to their performance uh, and uh, as they uh, determine their fees really the the volume we're bringing in uh, and the, the steadiness of that uh, uh, really translates pretty directly into the steadiness of, of those landfill charges or uh, while there are increases uh, we stay away from the big fluctu big fluctuations Repair vehicle for a fleet like ours and solid waste is going to be a big line item. Um, again, we're fortunate to have uh, uh, good mechanic staff in a central garage that's uh, capable to, of, of uh, taking care of uh, the fleet. Uh, we try to keep a fairly new fleet, uh, as you all well know, those of you who have been on the commission uh, for, uh, for at least a year, if I think been through one solid waste truck purchase, maybe all of you have through one I, trying to trying to think when we, we just purchased our last one or i think it was two about three meetings ago as a matter of fact so uh pretty regularly cycling out uh our fleet and uh staying current with that fleet that helps keep this line item uh down um but still uh still a pretty sizable sizable line item uh Fuel is uh, another big item for a, a department that by and large is big vehicles driving around and, and, uh, and picking up trash. Uh, some experimentation during uh, the last few years with natural gas being part of our fleet. Uh, we probably haven't seen, uh, uh, seen many years where it's been noticeably different than, than, than uh, normal petroleum based fuels. So, uh, that, that experiment's still a little bit ongoing. You'll see a new equipment line item. We are scheduled for a new piece of equipment in, uh, in 2021. You'll see this number was bigger in 2020, uh, 497. That included two, two, two units. All right, so that's it for before I move to recycling. Do you have any questions on solid waste expenses? And Andy, do you uh, want to highlight any line items? Yeah, there's only one line item I think that we need to highlight that you haven't haven't looked at, and it would be the land purchase math for that 850,000 that they see. Um, if you look at that from 2019, that's where we purchased the property east of. The electric service center for future development of public works facility when that comes up and then this 850,000 is is part of the line item dollars we put in there the the two pieces of land that we approved to purchase at the last meeting for 27,000 and change I think it was I don't know off the top of my head will come out of this line item but this is also a line item we're looking at uh, talking about a plan for uh, 
plans for the building. And so that's what that is in there for. It's technically not land purchase exclusively, but we don't have a line item that says architecture. So we put it in that line item. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate you giving, uh, bringing that up. And, and that's uh, certainly one of the projects that the um, commission can give some consideration to as the budget develops. Uh, the next step now that the land is purchased would be designing uh, designing a facility uh, to put um, all of the public works and public utilities operations in uh, in one location. Yeah, Andy, this is uh, Mayor Unruh. I have a question as far as, I do. You, I know that you had, I I'm curious about your capacity to store fuel or do you work with a local, um, a local vendor, I mean, a local gas station or a local diesel station? I'm curious, I know that costs will be down, so I'm sure there'll be some savings, but I'm just curious about how that you work with that with fuel. We, well, the CNG trucks are from Spark out at the, by, well, at the bypass, but the truck stop at the corner of Fulton and campus. That's where we fill up the CNG trucks. However, the city as a whole, we purchase all of our fuel from you pump it. And to be able to break down how that is billed in, um, um, per gallon, I, I can't give you that answer right now. I, I know we get good fuel rates. We don't have the capacity to store fuel. So we go to the pumps and fill up right now. Uh, in the future, if, if we build a new building or whatever facility, this kind of stuff, that would be something we would start to consider and look at the expense of that and see, is there a way to do that, but right now we don't we don't have that ability. So that might be a consideration in the future. Thank you. And we do bid that bulk purchase of uh, of fuel, and it comes in the form of a uh, of a discounted uh, per gallon rate. So, all right. Any other questions before we move to recycling? Now, recycling is part of the. Uh, solid waste utility will tell you that if it were independently budgeted, it would not likely be an enterprise fund. It would more likely be a general service just because the revenue, I mean, you saw the $30,000 projected revenue against um, uh, $238,000 expense. Um, it's a drop off with remote drop off site system uh, for staff members. Uh, we um, it, there's there's a little bit of expense associated with uh, with the equipment and the recovery of the uh, of the trailers and then the in-store commercial collection, which is a little bit more office collection, I, I would say. Uh, but by and large, most of the expense is related to the salaries and benefits. Uh, so do you have? Uh, you have questions on recycling. Andy, are, is there anything in here you'd like to highlight? I don't really, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. There's not really anything in there out of the ordinary that I would say trash containers, you know, we, we budget 4,000 there at the 6185 line item. Mm -hmm. Last year, we didn't have to purchase anything. If that's replacing something in a trailer or replacing a bin in the shop or even the recycling containers out on the road on terminal, that's where that stuff comes from. You can see the year before we got closer to that 4,000, but you might ask, well, why do we have trash containers in recycling? Well, this is this is what these are the areas that we have trash containers and recycling and so um that's where we put it probably won't spend all of that and hopefully we can do another year where it's less than the 2963 but other than that i really don't have anything unless there's some questions some good detail uh here um that shows the 2020 and the 2021 the 2020 uh um, revised budget and some of the um, noteworthy line items and the 2021, uh, some of the breakdowns. So if there's a large number, uh, the new equipment vehicles, it gives a little bit more detail in there. All right, Andy, thank you. Uh, 
I guess you're, you're hanging around for this one too. Drainage utility. Um, when we, when we go through and you name off the utilities we operate, this is one that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we we forget to mention, but uh, certainly is an important one. Uh, the drainage utility that the revenue is um, there. There's a fee on every residential and every commercial property. Uh, the uh, that that generates about three hundred thousand dollars a year. The uh, this pays for uh, a person, a stormwater or code officer. Uh, we did have a, a stormwater coordinator. Now that the, those duties are fulfilled by our code officer who uh, does this and uh, additional code compliance uh, through neighborhood and development services. We've got um, uh, we've got uh, expenses. Well, we we do carry a cash balance in this fund and have uh, have some annual expenses related to. Uh, curb and gutter repair. So this is taking care of the drainage, the, the, the urban drainage system, uh, maintenance of, uh, of ditches, um, curb and gutter replacement. Um, so like inroad uh, uh, containment and flow, and then also subterranean uh, uh, capture and flow into the ditch system and the, and the, uh, and the outflow into the river. Uh, you, while we, um, you know, certainly have a big project in, in, in the uh, east side drainage pond, uh, and there's some big expense related to, you know, making that whole east side drainage uh, project work, uh, this utility fund isn't of sufficient size to carry the debt service on a project like that. So this is going to, this, this budget is more maintaining that system, which is already built. And then actually adding to that system or building to that system is going to be something that you take on um, through bond and interest fund or some sort of general government um, uh, or general fund expense. But once it's up and running, uh, this utility then maintains it or that income off of each residential and commercial bill is sufficient to cover uh, the maintenance expense. So probably more a stormwater maintenance utility what, rather than just a stormwater utility in and of itself. Andy, do you have? Uh... Yeah, I do. I do want to bring a little bit. If Matt, if you could pull up that uh, expense contracted project at the very end of the supplies operations stuff, just to bring attention to a few things. On that, yeah, keep going down. Uh, where I have the line items of what what we pay for different projects, not in the not oh. at the top, but at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, right there, just to bring a little attention to that. You know, we have a project that we may have to do um, in Chapel Heights in an alley on drainage, possibly, depending on when the development's done. If we have some trouble with an alley that. Um, may have some issues of holding soil in place. We may have to do that, may not. We see some potential issues. Uh, the east side retention pond task order. Uh, so some of the engineering that Matt was talking about on the, the east side retention, we've got some money set aside there. And also the FEMA study, we have money set aside there for to pay for that study. So some of that's coming out of here, but by and large for the most, we would do some cleaning services but by and large it is a a maintenance utility and so just kind of wanted to let you see why why so big in one year and not in the other well there's a big line item on the fema study so but really that's all and andy is that would that be described is that engineering money or is that construction money for some hypothetical uh, buying down of the cost? Of Probably can't speak to all of it, but I do believe it's engineering money for okay. the most part. All right. So. Any questions for Andy on the drainage utility? Hearing none, thank you, Andy. Thank you. I believe that concludes the budget presentation.
you all will be excited to know that Melinda should be back for the next budget presentation. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, you may get, you may get me again. Yeah. Thank you, Ann. Thank you for having everybody available to answer questions. I really appreciate that. Uh, the executive session uh, don't anticipate any uh, action being necessary uh, following following that. Uh, so let's jump, uh, if you don't mind, to the consent agenda, and then conclude uh, conclude business with uh, the commissioner reports. Um, to the consent agenda item, if uh, there aren't any items that the commission would like to pull off and discuss separately, the appropriate motion would be to approve consent agenda items M1 through 4. I'll for a motion. Commissioner Sosna makes the motion to approve the consent, and the consent agenda items M1 through 4. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Commissioner Euler, I'll second so we have a second by Commissioner Euler. Um, any further discussion? Let's do the roll call. All those in favor, ayes, uh, nays. So Commissioner Cessna? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Mayor Unruh, aye. Passes five to zero. Thank you so much. That concludes the uh, public business portion of the meeting, Mayor. Um, I'll turn it over to you to facilitate commission reports. Okay, well, thank you everyone for a long meeting. And after commission reports, we, we will talk about our um, executive session. And Commissioner Sess and I, I would ask, I'm requesting if you would to, uh, go ahead and lead us into that after we're done with the commission reports. And with that, we'll start with you for commission reports. Thank you. I had an opportunity to do the uh, morning prayer by phone last week at St. Catherine Hospital as a community leader. Uh, this was a request made by the uh, chaplain at the hospital. The prayer was for the safety and strength of the healthcare staff as well as employees along with the healing of the patients at the hospital. So um, fulfilled that request and hopefully everybody stays strong and uh, heals quickly. A uh, great annual report from the fire department. A lot of good information that was contained in the report. Uh, also um, is a good recruiting tool for the, the department. I received, like we kind of mentioned during the water uh, report, a colorful water report uh, for my home on the update on water usage. Uh, it really gives the residents a good idea of what they're using, how it compares to other uh, homes of comparable households and um, so it's good information to use. Uh, also please do your report and reply to the uh, 2020 census if you have not already done so. Uh, it's easier than one, two, three. If you have to choose one way to respond to the 2020 census, if you can do it online uh, or mail or by phone. Uh, really, technically, you can do it online from your phone, but um, that's neither here nor there. But uh, again, it's if you go to my2020census.gov and be counted if you haven't already done so today, it really helps our community and region on a number of issues. I'd like to thank the Garden City Area Chamber of Commerce, Finney County Economic Development Corporation, Downtown Vision, and the Finney County Convention and a visitors Bureau on their help with the businesses in our community uh, during the pandemic. Uh, as we did today, we approved more of the community development block grant loans to help our small businesses during this unprecedented event that we're living through. Uh, we're continuing to improve on how we are conducting our meetings with the new format due to the distancing orders that are in place. I'd like to thank our, uh, the staff for all of their help behind the scenes in making this happen and uh, work really well. And then as we look to get back to normal and when the stay at home restrictions are lifted, I would like to reflect on the positive things that we've done or have changed uh, that we could do in the future, kind of like these Zoom meetings that we're doing right now, but um, looking at ways to improve, you know, uh, it's, you know, let's see if we can do this in a positive uh, fashion, you know, it, 
things change and we need to change with them as well. And then one last thing, um, I know these decision-making processes are hard at this time. Um, I watched the county commission and they have to go through a lot of hard decisions for not only for the county, but you know, we're making decisions for the city as well. So, um, but as long as we try to make the best out of it and you know, come out together and make it positive, I think we're, we'll um, come out better for, for this for our community. And that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Cessna. Great, I appreciate that. Commissioner Ortiz, happy birthday also. So I yeah, asked thank you before I did, but yeah, I couldn't believe we made it all this way. And what other place would you rather be than with us? So. Yep, exactly. Now, thank you for the wishes. Um, I just would like to echo what Commissioner Cessna had said and, and everything about just our decision making is 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 tough, but I do believe that we're on the right track with everyone being positive. Um, I would like to stress just the fact that we, you know, we do need to have a kind heart um, and just consider those around us. And and I, I think we all have it in our in our minds and and souls to do what's best um, for everyone, not just not just for you know. The person that person. Just stress to the fact that um, keep these seniors in your prayers and your thoughts. Um, I couldn't imagine going without, you know, a celebration or a prom or a graduation. So um, everything with those kids have gone through this past year and, and continue to go through. Uh, just keep those seniors um, in prayers. Those who are, who are in college, um, I know it's it's pretty stressful for for everyone around. So. Um, like I said, just kind hearts all around. I, I love everybody and just hope that we can get to a new norm. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ortiz. Commissioner Euler. Um, Well, to kind of echo what everybody says, it is hard to make these decisions. And, you know, I know when I think about trying to make a decision, it's, you know, for the good of the whole. And um, having information and or not having information or even sometimes just not, you know, tabling a thing. I, I think that Commissioner Ortiz is right and Commissioner Cessna and the fact that, you know, we make them with grace and uh, we, we do our best at the time. Um, but having said that, um, one thing that um, I want to encourage everybody to do is um, pick your favorite establishment to, to enjoy a meal and then get with a group of people and have a zoom dinner together um <laughs> you know we talk about social distancing and, and lately i've been thinking an awful lot about just quarantine fatigue and um trying to figure out how to connect and have that personal connection with people i'm not related to and so um some friends and I have gotten together and we've enjoyed a few meals and, and it really does help your spirit. It helps your heart. It helps uh, to remember to build those relationships. And so I just encourage you to, you know, frequent a local business and, and get together and enjoy some camaraderie using social media. Um, and also um, lately with United Way, um, if you find that you're in need of something, a uh, United Way, um, has, has been taking uh, phone calls um, on a pretty regular basis as far as providing basic assistance such as food boxes, uh, providing assistance for pets, um, just making sure that those basic needs are being met. And so, um, you, you know, Finney County United Way is here to help, but also through uh, Finney County Emergency Management, they're also helping with resources. And so we wanna make sure that during this quarantine time, that nobody is going without. And so um, we can be pretty creative with coming up with different things that are needed. So um, that's something that um, I wanted to make sure to mention. And also just, um, just to be respectful of one another, um, whether or not you choose to wear a mask out in public, um, you should wear one, but I mean, don't please be respectful. And I think I heard somebody say, you know, give grace and space. And I think that's so very important right now. So um, I just want to encourage everybody to continue to be graceful and, you know, together we'll get through this. 
Thank you, Commissioner Euler. Commissioner Dick. Well, first, uh, high five to anybody who doesn't have to be here and still on here for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, uh, like Commissioner Euler is saying, um, it's uh, Cinco de Mayo. Nobody said that yet. I mean, second in, in importance to uh, Commissioner Ortiz's birthday. Um, but if you do need a reason to get out and go get something to eat tonight, um, there's a, there's your reason to do it. I mean, we all need excuses to do stuff like that. Um, everybody touched on the things that I had wrote down to to, to touch on, but I'm going to say one well one thing since it's definitely do that that we can't say that enough. Um, but again, it's it is just impressive of how well our school district has handled the continual education. I hear from more friends and more families how it's going in other cities and other states, and they are amazed at what we're doing as a as a school district and the effort that their teachers are putting into and the amount that our kids are still learning. And that's not what's happening everywhere. So again, great job to everybody at the school district for making that happen. And that's all I got to say. Oh, well, thank you, Commissioner Dick. I appreciate that. Um, so just to round it out, uh, of course, I could say ditto to everything most people have said. I do want to um, point out a couple of things. There were some thank you notes in our packet this time, actually handwritten thank you notes and then um, that people sent in. That was really neat. I mean, I, a lot of us have experienced thank yous from the um, giving dollars back on their utility bill. And so I, I the, the handwritten thank you notes and also for the things that the city is doing. Um, I also um, want to uh, comment on the idea. I love that grace and space. So I know that um, the, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce and Finney County Economic Development, as well as Downtown Vision have really been working hard to create that reopening guide and um, you know, really have uh, made themselves available to the County Commission, which I also want to, you know, and, and Commissioner Orley said grace and space, or I think so Commissioner Dick did also. You know, they are in a tough position. They are really taking the lead on this. And we as a city have, have agreed to really stand with them in solidarity to really make sure that we're doing the most we can. Um, I did receive a, a very thoughtful talking about seniors. So if you've not done the Adopt a Senior 2020 on Facebook, it's a lot of fun. And by the time I get to someone, they've already been adopted four times. So um, anyway, it's it's a bummer. Right? You have to be fast. If if you're not a Facebook fan, if you're not a Facebook user, you better get used to it. Um, but the Adopt a Senior is a really great program, um, and so we're really excited about the seniors we've adopted. We're excited about um, getting them something. I, I wanted to say. Um, Senior Cameron, I'll just use his first name, wrote me a very thoughtful letter about thanking us for the things we're doing around safety and you know, just reiterating this idea of what it looks like to physically distance. I, Commissioner, um, Commissioner um, Lung Pishney talked about physically distancing but socially connecting. I know that we've talked about that and you know, wearing masks as you know, modeling that behavior in and out of stores. And, and I don't know if it's necessary to use in your cars, but I mean, you know, in and out of stores, I think that's valuable. And this idea of really uh, making sure that we're doing everything we can to, you know, minimize trips and stay at home. Uh, he was very thoughtful. I was able to write back to him and then also send the letter on to the county commission. Just again, people are really looking at this um, and they're saying thank you. And, and so a lot of the work we're doing is really making a difference. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but um, Mayor Fankhauser used to give Matt notes. I don't know if he gave them to anybody else, but I was thinking about um, some really... Now, these were nice notes too, but um, I'm thinking about some quotes. Uh, and you know, this one I, I thought about the other day, it says, this is from President um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. He said, um, do what you can with what you have where you are. And I'm gonna tell you, this is, this is you know, we have a lot, we have a lot here in Garden City. Um, if you get out, if you don't get out early in the mornings, I'm gonna tell you, it has been beautiful. Every, this is the longest spring I can ever remember. Um, and so I'll tell you, it's a beautiful to get out and again, but that idea to do what you can with what you have, where you're at and where we're at is here in Garden City. And I'll tell you, this is a great place to be. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and adjourn the commission reports. And um, I know that we will need to do an executive session. And then for the purpose of um, for, st uh, for staff matters, personal matters on that. But anything else, Matt, before we ask um, Commissioner Sessa to make that motion? I don't think that there is. Um, just a reminder, it's about 5.05 by the time the uh, motion gets done. You wanted about five minutes to start it. 
I think you were going to go an hour. Is that correct, Mayor? No longer than an hour. Right? You were going to start, so you would be starting at 510 and going to 610. Staff will leave uh, the public meeting going, but there's going to be a screen there that says the commission's in executive session. While you don't anticipate action being taken, um, uh, we need to do that. So you all be jumping off and doing your executive session. Uh, and the specific purposes for the evaluation of the city manager, uh, Commissioner Sesta, when you articulate the specific purpose after the uh, uh, after the other part of the statute. Now, could I ask a question real quick of um, the city attorney? Uh, can, Randy, can if we finish earlier, can we come out of exec executive session earlier, or do we need to stay in the whole hour? Uh, the recommendation is that you stay in the executive session for the the uh, period of time that you've requested it, the reason being that uh, those that might want to be at the meeting when you come out of the executive session would then be there to see what you do at this particular point you don't intend any binding action correct right exactly uh, i'd recommend that you err on the side of not going for the full or ask for an hour you might ask for 45 minutes and if you have to come back out and extend for an additional period of time that way you're not just sitting in executive session for 15 minutes not doing anything yeah because i um, i'm thinking back to previous um times like this and i think the 45 minutes might be might be adequate so um with that i would recommend 45 minutes Can, commissioner says if you would go ahead and do that Okay, I'm on. Okay. I make the motion that we go into executive session pursuant to KSA 7543 or 75-4319B1 pertaining to personal matters of non-elected personnel and their contractual obligations because if this matter were discussed in open session, it might invade the privacy of those discussed. And this is in specific uh, reference for uh, the city manager. Uh, and we'll go in at 510 and the meeting, the executive session will go for 45 minutes and we'll exit out of the executive session at 555. So there's a motion. Do we have a second? Commissioner Ortiz, I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. Um, one further roll call here, Commissioner Cessna. Aye. Commissioner Ortiz. Aye. Commissioner Euler? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Mayor Unruh, aye. So make sure that you do not, so as I have it at five to zero, make sure you don't close out this meeting, just minimize it and you'll be getting another link so that you will go into executive session. We'll see you in executive session. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
So I see everybody back. We're going to call back our uh, com the commissioning back in order. And so I just want to let you know that there was no binding action taken. And so with that, do we need anything else? <laughs> what is that? Hey. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's good. Hey, everyone, have a great rest of your week. Thank you so much. Is that all we need to do, Celine? Yep, that's it. All right. We're Thank adjourned. you. Thank you. Thanks.